Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the WrestleMania weekend edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. We don't know what's going to happen because it's WrestleMania weekend and almost nobody cares. And AEW is getting Wednesday nights to themselves, and will anyone care? And what else will we talk about? I don't care. And to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's the podcaster who cares, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here <laughs> once again. Of course, I think the audience all know that I care so very much about all of them. You're a caring person. Swerve! I don't fucking care! Oh, come on! We gotta care. It's WrestleMania weekend. Somebody's gotta care. Yeah, I guess It so. might as well be us. <laughs> might as well. Oh! I'm all... <laughs> what? What's the matter with you? You did the Jerry Clower. It made me oh. laugh. Oh! <laughs> Shoot that thing! It's Now there's two of them. WrestleMania is multiplying. It's like the goddamn green shit that grew on Stephen King and Creep Show. It's, it's <laughs> inching up our limbs, preparing to take over our brains. I guess all the, the mud show fucks are upset. They only have half a mud show down there in Florida this week. Uh, most of the mud shows didn't run. Only the muddiest of the mud shows are running down there. That was their big payday and chance to hit each other over the head with car batteries and fucking boxes of tampons or whatever they do. I don't know. Well, that will soak up the blood. Things. That's probably That'll a good soak idea. Up. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's good to be able to have a ring surrounded by razor blades and tampons match. I've only seen two things about the independent scene that is around WrestleMania. Of course, this year is a completely different year than any of the other years. They've toured the Indies, brought vaudeville to WrestleMania. And the two things I've seen the most are, it's very, I don't know if very and underwhelming go together, but it's underwhelming <laughs> and people are noticing, I mean, some of the shows I heard there was no one there and that's sad. But the other thing apparently is Teddy Hart's been kicked out of her band from every venue after a certain point, whatever happened. What? And, what? <laughs> I don't know. I saw a picture of him. What did he do? I don't know. I saw a picture of him in like pink pajamas or something. What? <laughs> and he's had a little entourage of people and it was him being yelled at by some wrestler or whoever this guy was. I don't know. But some guy's just screaming at Teddy Hart and Teddy Hart, you know, he always knows himself. What did I do? You know, what, what's your problem? I have a <laughs> ticket. And the guy, you know, was going to kick the shit out of Teddy Hart. And then I saw another tweet that said Teddy Hart is banned from our show. <laughs> He may, he may have got that from Davy Boy. It wasn't me. It was Owen. I wasn't even there. <laughs> oh, but it, I, you know, it just that's usually you know the uh, you hear about the furniture stunt show promotions and everything, and and hopefully that's been kept to a minimum this year. But it, it's it's a hectic week for everybody. Uh, I was going to mention the weather is 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 turned south here. Rain and cooler after it's been nice and sunny and warm all of a sudden and the pollen is is how hopefully the rain will at least keep the pollen down do they do that up there brian i lived up there but i can't remember ever watching the tv news do they give the the pollen report the allergy report the pollen count all that stuff on your tv weather up there i think so and although i'm someone who's been watching they the news since i'm a kid and i always watch the weather because the pollen doesn't really affect me i've never really paid any attention so i, I think i've, I've I was wondering because they have no plants up there. Oh, come on. That's in, in New York. You I know, live in the Garden I, State. The Garden State. Boy, I tell you what. I don't know what they're planting, but the Garden State doesn't smell like any flower bed I've ever walked through. I live in a uh, very but, wonderful smelling part of the Garden State, and they're planting marijuana now, so it'll smell a lot better pretty soon. <laughs> Wait a minute. If, when, since when did you become they? I didn't say me. No, no, no. You don't, you don't have a green thumb? I'm afraid the gardener will take it. So I don't do the it. gardener. The gardener. Is that Kippelman? Is he doing? No, 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 no. Lou is a superstar producer and he should be a PA announcer for a baseball team. He has that voice. I, th I heard he was a PU announcer, but <laughs> nevertheless, anyway, for all the people that have asked, let's start off with, uh, thank everybody for, um, uh, Stacy had her back surgery this past Monday. That's why we, we, we haven't talked a lot this week because we pre-recorded that 
the the drive through last week early so we could do uh, stay surgery on Monday. But um, she was it wasn't a long procedure. Um, you know, they I dropped her off at one o'clock. I think they took her in about two ish. Uh, she was back in the car by five o'clock Whereas I have to sit out in the parking lot because of COVID, right? So it's the first 80 degree day. So I'm sitting out there in the sun. Um, but that was, and you know, she was obviously kind of sore and woozy, but when she got home that evening, she was up with a cane and kind of walking around and said, well, maybe this isn't going to be so bad. And then by the next morning, all the shit had worn off. And then she was miserable for, uh, you know, a couple of days. Cause it's, it's, it's not a big incision, but it's right on, obviously on the spine and <clears throat> they, what was the phrase they used? Uh, her nerve is still sore because it's been compressed for a while, they say. Uh, so that's the, the main part. The incision doesn't look bad. It's not like that. It's still the, the actual pain in the, in the innards. But anyway, uh, but she's doing better. Uh, no uh, complications that we're aware of. The physical restrictions they put on this is insane. It's like, don't, don't get in a car for about a month and uh, don't lift anything over 10 pounds for three months or whatever, which is practically everything that you do deal with in your daily life is, is almost a 10 pound pull. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, thank you. Jacked up Jeremy Bagley for the, gift basket and the cult cornet facebook group for the uh, basket and gift and and everybody i'm gonna be forgetting people and a lot of people have emailed and everything but thank you for checking in on that so and harley is doing wonderfully she was concerned also because she can tell when mommy is is feeling puny but now harley's perking back up also i know you've had knee issues and obviously neck issues did you ever have a back problem throughout your career as a manager as an um, active manager no, I never had any fucking, besides the knees, I felt good when I was managing, taking all the bumps. It's only when I quit. And after a while, I started <laughs> noticing things. But um, I've my back bothers me now, uh, just like cramp it up, especially if I stand a long period of time, certain things. I had physical therapy on my right hip uh, almost 10 years ago because it was poor and, and people that see me, if I, they have dinner with me or whatever, with those few individuals will see, I'm always sitting in weird positions. I'm leaned back. I got one leg stretched out. I'm, you know, fucking over. I got to move around. I can't. And then and those drives were starting to become an issue also. So I'm glad I'm done with those. But, uh, but besides the uh, let's see the calcium deposit on my right side of my right big toe, uh, the no ACL in my right knee and the lack of about 50 or 60% of the cartilage, the replaced ACL in my left knee, um, the two or three scopes, the hernia surgery, two hernia surgeries, the physical therapy on my right hip, uh, back issues, but not bad enough to fuck with. Uh, my kind of sore shoulder and the neck that I can't turn all the way around. For whatever reason, my left arm feels incredible. For whatever so, reason, yeah. Anyway, um, and speaking of people who will feel incredible, <laughs> um, the first two hundred figure in between making sure that that Harley is is taken care of and Stacy's taken care of. Wednesday and Thursday, I packed the first 200 action figures, signed them and packed them and shipped them off on Friday morning. And the people will be hearing this on Saturday, the uh, 10th, late at night uh, because of our schedule. Uh, but by Monday morning, we'll be shipping another 200 figures. And for those interested in this process, I'm doing the a, a, a large portion of the orders were people that ordered a two pack of figures and nothing else, just the two pack and boom. So to get more room in the garage, get more figures out and get speed going at the start to get me some momentum, I'm tackling the two pack. So if you ordered a two pack in the next week, week and a half, your shit, hopefully will be winging its way to you. And then we're going to, uh, then I'll, I'll give you updates on what we're going to start on next, but we're attacking this in an orderly and scientific fashion. And I just, what does a hundred and three 12 by nine by three boxes 
packed into a Ford Expedition look like? And how long you think it takes a nearly 60-year-old man with the physical limitations that I just listed to get those things <laughs> in the front door? So this is a process, and there will be some figures left on sale when I fulfill these orders and reopen the store, but that's not going to be until sometime in May at least. And hopefully also Hotchkiss is working his fingers to the bone. And they they were already skinny to begin with, especially the sixth one on his left hand. Uh, but uh, we may have an all new Jim Cornette.com by then. Who knows? We're trying to, we're working toward that. And anyway, folks, by the way, just to make sure that people don't get too jumpy, when you get your action figures, folks, you first, first lucky recipients, uh, tweet a picture. Tweet a picture of the figures when you take them out of the box with the hashtag, it can happen to you to give some people hope because another part of my old website that I'm going to set fire to, I'm going to figure out some way to set fire to a website when we finally, when we got rid of this, because it didn't, it got fried one time and didn't, and now it's not sending out the confirmation emails. So I got everybody's order. You might not know. Anyway, it hashtag it can happen to you, folks. These these figures are coming. The most long awaited. How long did it take Tom Schultz to do that fucking third Boston album? Years. Well, it ain't going to take me that long. So I'm smarter and quicker than an MIT guy. How about that? Huh, anyway, what's new with you? Not much. Just hanging out. Well, good. All right, I guess that's the end of the program. Um, the Mets are winning. That's what matters. I really don't care. Who did they beat? Who did the Mets ever beat? Well, so far they've beaten the Florida Marlins, and they just played the Phillies. They beat the Phillies. And Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who in Eddie Marlin's family lives in Florida? Wouldn't that be something? Do you think because his name was Marlin, he had like a jersey or something that he purchased? <laughs> In the 25 years, 30 years that the team's been in existence? I don't know. As a matter of fact, I think they should have purchased a picture of Eddie Marlin. He was the most famous Marlin first. And speaking of which, I have an email here about people's identities and things and such. It's a poor transition, but we'll stick with it. Um, This is an email from Brian in South Florida. So Florida man. Um, and it brings up an interesting point, even though it's not about an interesting person. Jim and Brian, I knew nothing of Ethan Page till he arrived at AEW. He did the ladder match thing. Then the following week, he had a good match against Allen Five Angels. Of course, this is, once again, the comments of our viewers do not represent those of management here. After that match, he berated Justin Roberts, which I liked a lot. Well, I think everybody can get behind berating Justin Roberts. He then went on to give a great heelish promo that was overconfident, annoying, and prickish. It was great, and I was sold on Ethan Page. I instantly wanted to see more. But after Googling him, and God, doesn't that sound oddly sexual to use that in that fashion? After Googling him, instead of matches, I found a ton of social media crap. I mean, massive amounts. He was backstage with every outlaw goof yucking it up. Doing blogs from home, surrounded by toys, comic books, and nerdy shit. Hey, you know, I mean, we all like our comic books. Only the classic stuff. But he said, here he is now, raffling off a toy and joking about his trip to Disney. Just like that, I realized the larger-than-life heel promo was total bullshit. The bubble burst, and I no longer gave two shits about seeing this goof in the ring ever again. This is an exact example of what Jim has been saying for the past year. Is anyone believable anymore? Okay, I know nobody gives a shit about Ethan Page, but this raises a a better point, and except I got to go back to the phrase, the larger-than-life heel promo that Ethan Page cut. And I'm not knocking Brian, because I guess for today's standards it may fit. But is this where we are that that's a promo that's larger than life just because this jerk comes off one week as a kind of a obnoxious heel? What do you think? Is that a larger than life promo these days? I mean, I'm not, I'm not as negative on him as you because 
he's done stupid stuff, but just about everybody in the business has done stupid stuff. And from what I read, Impact kind of made him do it, or at least insisted on him doing it. But with that said, I liked his promo, but I wouldn't call it, it wasn't like a really special promo. And that's not to take anything away from it. It was fine for what it was, but over the top heel promos, just like of all time, or how was it phrased? Uh, Larger than life. Larger than life heel promos. Give me a break. (laughs) Give me a break. And here's the problem. Okay, this is the main point that I was going to bring up about this. 90% of the major box office attractions in professional wrestling would probably not have drawn a dime if people had known the real guy instead of the gimmick guy that was presented to them and that the talent made them believe was them. I That's... And and there's there's obviously there's exceptions to that rule there always is but it, it, that's what these guys don't understand is wrestling has never been an actor playing a character whether you like it or not it's you that's why I always felt like guys ought to have a, a pretty good say in who they were because they were going to have to be that but maybe in television, maybe it was this, was it the, could you liken it to the heyday of the soap operas when, you know, the actor playing the heel on the soap opera that fucked around, you know, the baby face girl or whatever people, old women would be bashing him with umbrellas on the fucking street corner, but it's not an actor playing a part. It has to be you and the larger than life personalities in the history of wrestling in any era always knew that and conveyed who they were supposed to be to the people instead of who they really were which is why they got over and stayed over in my opinion your thoughts brian yeah i mean there were some guys who successfully were able to be completely different people i mean on the on one side of it, you always heard stories like the heels are the nice guys and the baby faces are the jerks. Like you always heard that as a fan. But the one big one I could think of, and most guys, you know, Michael Hayes is a version of Michael Hayes. That's what he was. That's why the yeah. Freebirds worked. The one big one on the other side I could think of, Pampero Furpo, the wild bull of the pompous, was going back to his hotel room, the scrapbook. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. that's just radically different, but. You know, he's a guy who came to this country and really worked hard and wanted to achieve a lot of things, and he had a goal in mind, and he had a say, like you said, he had a say in who he was because he knew what he could comfortably do. Abdullah the Butcher, the wild man from the Sudan, who caused riots, gauged in bloodletting, if people had known that he was a obese African-American man from Ontario named Larry Shreve... <laughs> It wouldn't have had the same fucking impact, even if he did exactly the same thing that he did for his entire career, if they had known that was the, the, the chic, for God's sake. But I mean, you can, you can find something. I mean, if, Flair may have been a, 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 an evergreen guy. I mean, the guys, because he was so similar, except then if, if there had been social media and he revealed his insecurities... Because Flair had problems that he's talked about with self-confidence. Absolutely nobody that that idolized Ric Flair would have wanted to hear that. You, you become a larger-than-life character by not admitting your human frailties. So, therefore, you know... Obviously, if you pointed out anybody's flaws and and shortcomings or assholery or whatever, it would damage their their uh, uh, image with some people. But for professional wrestlers, just doing ordinary things makes you a, more of an ordinary person. And for some reason, the younger generation feels that they want to identify with their heroes. But no, they they basically, I think, want to say, well, look at him. He's a schlub like me, and he's on TV. But that's a very small subset of the audience, as we see. 
the way that people got over was somehow you i mean my god there were plenty of people in the country that knew eight years after world war ii that hans schmidt wasn't really a German Nazi. He was a French Canadian from Montreal named Guy LaRose. Some people knew that, but not a lot, because if they had, he would not have been one of the five highest paid professional athletes in the United States of America. You see what I'm saying? If you just admit you're playing a part, then you are telling the people that you are fabricated, synthetic, manufactured, phony. Whether you're in a phony business or not sometimes was immaterial to a lot of people that they would believe in you. Stone Cold Steve Austin is the most modern example. But can you, I mean, just think of people down through history. If people had known who they, you know, who they really were or what they were really like, either the heels were, were so good, such real good guys, or the baby faces turn out to be such obnoxious pricks or whatever. But, you know, the thing is, and that was, that was the, the, you said that you always heard the heels were nicer guys when you were a fan, because for the most part, think about this. Wrestlers were so over in, in, at, in those time periods that it was like being a rock star when you were a baby face and that people idolized you all the time. And it was very easy, especially if you had that character trait to begin with to become a self-obsessed, obnoxious prick, right? Cause that's what causes that is people fawning and making and petting all over you all the time. But the heels, <laughs> they were, they knew the absurdity of it. that They're supposed to go out and just piss people off and be rotten bastards. They got all their aggravation out and they were usually in a better mood. <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's, it, that's another thing that they don't teach in wrestling school and in the developmental centers or whatever. They don't teach people how to be, how to sell themselves and be interesting personalities. They give them gimmicks, but they don't teach them how to be stars themselves in wrestling and work and what wrestling is all about and the way to think about it as you used to learn in the territories and in the cars with veterans or whatever. And I, maybe OVW was the last place to emphasize that kind of mindset and behavior. But now they teach them from the start, oh, you're playing a part and you're an entertainer. And as a result, you get a bunch of people going out and pretending to be people. How about that Matt Jackson, his acting? Be See, that's the thing. Yeah, he's trying to be someone he clearly isn't. Think about this, folks. We all, when we were kids, made believe we were somebody. Where was the, you know, when you were in the 50s, you were wanting to be a cowboy or a fucking cop or whatever the popular TV show was. But you always acted like or played like or wanted to be like or dreamed that you'd be this or that or the other thing. But when you got into wrestling in the territory days, when it was more structured and professional, you couldn't just say, I want to be a goddamn space alien from the planet Zambodia and get to do it without whoever was booking or running a show said, fuck you. We don't do space aliens. You're from Pittsburgh. Figure out something else, right? It, the, it, now people are just allowed to be as preposterous as they want to. So they're still play acting and th they're just adults play acting. And it, it's it, unfortunately that's, I think in large part, what has led to the massive viewer turnout of all wrestling of any genre today, because you can't believe anybody anymore. Anyway, that's just my opinion. You know what else you can't believe? Have you seen this? Here's a great segue. I have just a, a minute on this. They have redone the TV show Kung Fu. Brian, have you seen this? Have you heard about this? I heard about it, but I haven't seen anything. For the younger viewers, in the early 70s, 
right as martial arts in the United States were released the first time, the Kung Fu movies, uh, martial arts schools are opening up. It's starting to be a cool thing. You got Black Belt magazine, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> um, in 1972, I think it was ABC, was it not? I believe it was ABC. But they bring to the fall season a big new TV show, Kung Fu. And the the story is that a half Chinese, half American guy named Kwai Chang Kane had a Chinese mother, uh, American father, and w went to a mon uh, uh, suffered persecution. Went to a Tibetan, not a Tibetan monastery. Wherever they they do the kung fu stuff, the monastery, right? lived from the time they were he was a small child with them and finally when he became an adult snatch the pebble from my hand grasshopper and it will be time for you to leave key luke played the master master poe who was key luke was one of the number one sons in the charlie chan movies were warner brothers in the 30s this was fucking classic stuff but anyway kwai chang kane in search of his father goes back to America and suffers again all kinds of persecution and whatever in the Old West of the 1870s when he's working on the railroad with the other Chinese folks and he never wants to instigate violence. He's a pacifist. But when they finally press him, he ends up in a fairly realistic manner. It wasn't like the goddamn Kung Fu movies where guys were doing triple flips off the roof. It was, But it was cool fight scenes for network TV at the time. He does the kung fu on the fucking bad guys, right? And and it's, you know, it ran for a few seasons. And there was a the big controversy about it at the time was that David Carradine was chosen to play the lead. He was not half or any part Chinese. He was John Carradine's son. And obviously the Asian Americans were pissed off and Bruce Lee wanted the role. However, the thing is, honestly, I think it's a better television program without Bruce Lee because of the way that they played it. And also people wouldn't have bought Bruce Lee in the old West at 140 pounds beaten up. This was network television. They wanted the big guy, right? But anyway, that was the only controversy was that Carradine was playing the role. And it's a pretty good television show. Now they've revamped it. Guess what it's about, Brian? I have no idea. I just heard they were revamping it. A college, a Chinese American college girl drops out, goes to a monastery, comes back, apparently not aged very much, because uh, she still looks very youthful, and and becomes a crime fighter in modern day San Francisco. Well, obviously, it's a completely different show. Yes, that's, that's not has no relationship to the original Kung Fu at all. Of course, yes, but they call it Kung Fu, and they and they. Why can't people leave classic ideas alone? For heaven's sake. I don't understand the, the why the fuck. Can you make up new shit, right? It's the same thing in wrestling. They're just fucking up the old shit. They won't make up any new shit. Have you heard about this TV offer also? I saw this on a commercial the other day. As you can tell, I'm a little bit slappy. I haven't had a lot of sleep this past week. But have you seen the TV offer where they sell you the thing, tell you how great it is, tell you how to order it, and then they say, and limited time only, get a second one free. Just pay a separate fee. Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen those. Typically, it's you pay the shipping. The shipping cost for a second item, and you get both items. Which is a separate fee. How are you getting the second one free? Just pay separate fee. Isn't that what you do when you buy another one? You pay another fee. So I don't see, I don't see how they can get away with that. And why do I want two turnip juicers? But anyway, beware out there, folks. If you get the second one free, but just pay a separate fee, you're not getting the second one free. You're buying it. <sighs> I hate untruth in advertising this has been consumer reports with jim Cornette. that's right i hate untruth in advertising and folks that's why you will get every goddamn thing you pay for and more value for your money 
and your balls will thank you as well as everybody else when you go to manscaped.com. Folks, Manscaped has been a tremendous sponsor for a long time, but now I'm just hearing that they're using their giant platform to raise awareness and uh, uh, knowledge of the most common form of cancer in men. Do you know this? In men age 15 to 35, the most common form of cancer in men is testicular cancer. I've that I've, thankfully I've passed that fucking if I'd have known that when I was 15 years old I'd have been scared out of my fucking wits. But anyway, um Manscaped in addition to providing the right tools and solutions for safe and easy manscaping has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. Together, TCS and Manscaped are committed to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35 and giving support for fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer as part of their, I'm not making this up, We Save Balls initiative. Folks, while you're down there cleaning up your sack, why not go ahead and give them a little investigation? Lumps, changes in size, any pain. Um, I obviously I would, that would be a thing that I would notice right off the bat if my balls hurt, but apparently some people just fucking skip over this. So anyway, uh, give it a quick check around there. And if anything's lumpy or swollen up, call your doctor. If anything's just hairy or stinky, go to manscape.com, get the perfect package 3.0, the products and liquid formulations that turn your bathroom into a salon for your balls, folks, crop preserver. Crop Reviver. The perfect package also includes the anti-chafing boxers that keep your crotchal area feeling cool and fresh. Anyway, manscaped.com. Use the code JCE and get 20% off and free shipping on anything at the site. Manscaped.com. Code JCE. 20% off and free shipping. And, and feel your fucking nads and make sure that they're they're not lumpy. Well, you know who's probably a big fan of Manscaped, Jim? Gary Hart. Because he's always shaving his head. Well, <laughs> it's a nice transition. I just thought, I just had one thought, though. My God. What if the Bieber cleavage gimmick that Shitstain pushed had gotten over? Would he have brought in a best friend for Bieber cleavage and named him Lumpy Balls? But anyway, Based off Gary Lump Hart. Lumpy Rutherford, of course. Yes, of course. It, well, yes. <laughs> if you have to explain the stuff, it's not funny. Everybody remembers old Lumpy Rutherford. And who played Fred Rutherford, his father? Oh, I forget. I know that I got the guy's yes. face in my head, but I can't remember Famed his name. character actor Richard Deacon, who was also Mel Cooley That's right. on The Dick Van Dyke Show. That's right. None of which had anything to do with Gary Hart, but here's how this all ties together, folks. <laughs> uh, they they have done legacy classes again for the WWE Hall of Fame, where they just put up the most unflattering picture of somebody that they can find uh, in black and white to make it look like they were all at the turn of the 20th century, regardless of whether they were or not, and quietly shove them in with a 90 second video right to make sure that they we all know that they're honoring the pioneers of the business that came before well in some cases it was to plug in notable gaps in the hall of fame for instance jim londis luthes like these <laughs> are the kind of guys that were just thrown in with the legacy inductees so there's still an element to that but now it just seems like I don't know what the criteria or standards <laughs> are to be on this list because you get just the full range of possibilities in each inductee class, induction class. In induction or indictment class. <laughs> um, okay, 2020. And, and obviously they did all these this year, but they did the, the two years in the same ceremony. So the 2020 class a legacy class started out with a guy who should have been in by any measure what 10 years ago when they were in san francisco or whenever it was ray stevens without a doubt hall of famer hall of famer the best worker of the 60s in ring he whether you call him the Shawn michaels of his day or whatever 
uh, or the Ric Flair of his day. Flair idolized St- Stevens. Uh, Steven, uh, Flair wasn't, Flair did the Nature Boy Buddy Rogers gimmick visually, but Flair's in ring style was more Ray Stevens because everybody always, just like they imitated Buddy Rogers, just like they imitated Ric Flair after him, they, they always imitated the the guy that was considered the best worker of the of the time period. So and Ray Stevens had number of runs in the WWF, so all the way around. Hall of Famer, no doubt. Right? Right next to him, Baron Michelle Leone. Interesting pick. Interesting pick. Not we're not scoffing at it. Not at all. It comes somewhere out of nowhere would have been good if it was the wrestlemania in los angeles in los angeles sense. yeah uh he, as we all know in 1952 i believe it was leone and luthez set the at then the first or the all-time gate record the first hundred thousand dollar gate in pro wrestling at gilmore field in los angeles leone was the top guy in la and thez was the world champion and leone was in the middle of a hot run and I obviously he didn't duplicate that anywhere else. He Leone had a successful career, but that was his pinnacle. So he's a Hall of Fame guy, but there are many cases you can make like that that we don't know how this was arrived at. That who in the office did Baron Leone, goddammit, how have we overlooked it? I don't know. Next, Gary Hart. And this picture, why did they, he's wearing a polo (laughs) shirt. He looks like he's chewing some popcorn. I don't know why they would have picked this picture of Gary Hart, but Gary Hart's a Hall of Fame manager. Uh, He was part of the hottest run in Florida, turning dusty, babyface. He was a successful booker. He came up with the Freebirds Von Erich's original angle, got it started, and then then unfortunately, you know, got sideways with Fritz and and wasn't there to see it play out till the end. <clears throat> um, you know, so yes, he's he's as managers go, he's a Hall of Fame guy. But what was wasn't there one time he was going to have a run there and something happened? They they didn't send the car to pick him up, and he's like, "What the fuck are these people jacking me around for?" And this was like. 15 years ago. I think Court no. Bauer had something to do with it. Or no, what there, was, I think it was like 84, 85. He was actually going to be one of those managers because they got all the managers from the Oh, territories. that's right. That's right. As, and, as I'm conflating two stories. That was the first time. And then Court Bauer pushed for him, but they, they, they felt he was too old. He had heat with someone. I want to say Jay Strongbow. Yes. It was someone. Was yeah. He had heat with someone who was tied in with the office. So he was in his eyes, sabotage before it even started. But in their eyes, you know, What's this guy's problem? He just got here. You know? So, I mean, it was both ways. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to be honest, Gary wouldn't have been allowed to do or be what made Gary Gary up there to begin with. But, uh, but yeah, I, re- I think it was Strongbow. And I, he, he was like, he's, I can hear him now in his head. I see the writing on the wall, brother. They're going to fuck me here. <laughs> and he just went back to Texas. You know, um, when I was a kid, I thought he was black. What you know, he did have it, at various points because he liked to sit out and tan, and he liked to sit out in the sun from his days in Florida. So at some points, he he had the dialect because he grew up in in Chicago in a mixed neighborhood, and he had the he had that manner of talking anyway, and then he accentuated it because it made him sound more street brother and a little more evil when he put the inflection in it like that, you know, but when he'd come up to you in the locker room, would you like some corn brother? You know, um, so it was all, he was sinister, but, um, that's why he liked the, the, the four of the Kabuki and the foreign, you know, heel types that he could be, make mysterious and give backstories to moon or moon the one the one man gang never had a name <laughs> yes he did moon <laughs> well that, that's where the one man gang never had a name until he got with gary hart and gary hart's well he's the one man gang but he would, he would call it your moon brother moon the one man gang and then he would talk about halstead street that's right outside of chicago that is that's everybody in chicago knows and halstead street also went not far from the 
UIC Pavilion, where we were working the NWA shows in Chicago. So that was kind of that whole flavor of get. But anyway, Gary Hart. Hey, listen, and again to the point we made earlier with Baron Michelle Leone, if WrestleMania was in Texas, Gary Hart would be perfect for that. Oh my God, yeah. WrestleMania, even in Chicago, because at least there's a backstory, and he's not like the main eventer for a Hall of Fame. That would have been nice, Chicago well, or and, Texas. And honestly, Florida. Gary Hart was yeah, huge in Florida and was the instigation for Dusty Rhodes becoming the biggest baby face of all time there over Eddie Graham at the box office, for heaven's sake. And, anyway. if, we, and if we want to go international, WrestleMania in Australia. Could do that oh, for Gary well, Hart, There too. you go. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know whether we'll see that one or not, just because <laughs> the time different. Well, who knows? It, I mean, it's not like it. We'll talk about that later on. Not like it needs to be a big fucking deal anymore. Uh, I'm going to skip over the next guy in the picture. We'll talk about him last. But the final guy in the induction class in the picture, Dr. Death Steve Williams. <laughs> what the? Maybe, they're, maybe they're paying him back for destroying his fucking, not only his career, but his legacy. Because to this day, you get these, we've talked about it. You get these fucking morons. Well, well this guy couldn't whip anybody. He wasn't so tough. Because of one fucking night when he tears his fucking hamstring, gets knocked out. Oh, my God. Uh, so maybe they're making up for that. But, was, you know, Doc is compared to some of the other people in this Hall of Fame, obviously head and shoulders above. If it was a all-time box office attraction major of uh, uh, Hall of Fame where everybody had to have major impact of a Londos or a Hogan or an Austin level, maybe Doc wouldn't make the cut. But in this, I don't see anything wrong with it, but except just the the irony of the only place he ever went where he wasn't a top guy, didn't get over, and wasn't used to, to at least some of his best abilities it puts him in their hall of fame your thoughts i think dr death is a hall of famer the strength of what he did in all japan and wwe seems to be accepting of international candidates for the hall of fame he was great from i would say great from what 86 on yeah 84 and 85 you're still figuring things out yeah you should see him in 82 and and boy <laughs> well, I, saw, I saw some of it <laughs> And I was there both uh, with him and again him in 84 and, and part of 85 when he was figuring things out. And he, he wasn't reckless, but boy, you would you couldn't go anywhere he didn't want you to go, no matter who you were, until he figured things out. And then he got a lot easier to work with. But I think, yes, Hall of Fame. For WWE Hall of Fame and based on who they've put in, like you said, he's not Hogan, Londis, Fez buddy rogers but certainly a wwe hall of famer as much as anybody and the last name brickhouse brown i knew brickhouse brown we work with brickhouse brown some brickhouse brown's a great guy but isn't this reverse racism because i i almost guarantee unless it was one of the Agents or producers there that might have known or worked with Brickhouse. I can't imagine anybody in that company. If you said, who do you want to put in the Hall of Fame? That anybody would have even known Brickhouse Brown's name or ever seen him before. Remember, this is a company where I came back from lunch one time and one of the secretaries said I had a message from a Harvey race. So point is. Is this not an obvious example of their looking for an African-American to be inducted even in a legacy class? And if so, who's in already that I don't, I hate to say this about Brickhouse, but who's in already that wasn't a bigger box office attraction than Brickhouse Brown that they couldn't have put in in this spot? I'm just asking. Let's clarify a little bit. For those of you who maybe only know Brickhouse Brown from when he was doing shoot interviews or maybe saw him for a brief period of time, he was great in Memphis. And he was always really good in the ring for the most part. Yeah. I remember when they brought him in the Mid-South in 84, I think. Yeah, yeah. It, we worked with him some. He was a good worker, a good guy, great shape. With that said, 
He was never a box office attraction anywhere. I can't imagine who would say Hall of Famer. And to what you talked about earlier, mentioned earlier, alluded to, the African-American wrestlers who were in and aren't in, I could be wrong. Someone's going to go, oh, he was a legacy inductee last year. But is Butch Reed in the Hall of Fame? Okay, good question. Um, I don't know the answer to it. But he ought to be, if he's not, before Brickhouse. I'm sorry. Because he was a bigger star in more places, and he worked for the WWF. Um, but the reason I point this out is because it gets, it gets glaring here in a minute that maybe they're trying to fill quotas instead of interested in honoring these individual people. So let, let's go to, do you want to go to 2021 and we can keep all those options open? And by the way, what you're referring to, I don't know if it's reverse racism or just racism. If they're literally just picking any African-American wrestler they can to meet an African-American quota for their Hall of Fame. Is that reverse racism or is that racism? Well, I, I, well, I, the only reverse part of it is that you're not downgrading someone of their race. You're upgrading someone of their because of their race. But that actually technically would just be racism, wouldn't it? Of, of, of some sort. I don't know. It just it looks awkward. Uh, as, as we'll get to in a minute, awkward. Let's, let's go through 2021 <laughs> and the first one and my, okay, absolutely no question. Dick, the bruiser, besides the fact that he, he caused so much trouble and got pissed off in 1957 that he just never paid to fine and never went back to fucking New York after the, you know, the riot made front page newspapers, uh, he would have. I'm sure probably at some point had a run in the WWF, WWWF. Um, he was a big star everywhere he went for 30 years, owned his own territory, was world champion there as well as out in Los Angeles when it meant something, was one of the top 10 box office attractions in the business on a few different occasions. Uh, iconic name, iconic look. Dick the Bruiser is a first ballot hall of famer in any kind of pro wrestling hall of fame i would have to think nobody could disagree with that again he's not londis or thez but that very next tier of guys you know the Sheik, dick the bruiser yeah. there are certain guys you kind of lump together as no-brainers hall of famers and and he was a guy people if if he wanted to go on vacation somewhere he would just call the territory and say book me I'm going to be there for a week. It'll pay for the trip. I mean, if everybody, whoever could book Dick the Bruiser when he would, after he got his own company, would work outside the territory and huge in St. Louis. Uh, even, and that, you know, that's the thing about Bruiser. Even when his own territory had aged out and kind of fallen apart, he was selling out in St. Louis in 1982. He'd been in the business 30 years. He was in his early 50s and he was drawing. What was that one house he did with, was it with Flair? Was it with was Flair, it with, yeah. Yeah, that was 18,000 at the Checker Dome? Yeah. Now he, anyway. was a, he was a big star till the very end of Sam Mushnick's run as a promoter. And yeah. to your point earlier, big in his own territory, Indianapolis. He owned a piece of Chicago, so I guess you can consider that as yeah. territory too. Detroit. Bruiser and Crusher were the iconic Chicago tag team. Now he's like the Midwest. Well, I shouldn't say the, because Vern fans will attack me. But he's <laughs> one of the Midwest Wrestling Hall of Famers without any question. Do you think Bruiser and, and Vern were ever like, well, Bruiser is probably mad at Vern because Vern was from Indian, uh, from Minneapolis and Bruiser was from Indianapolis and Minneapolis turned out to be a more lucrative market for longer. Because they both just, they they became big stars on network television then went home and bought or stole their own territories. It was, it was the formation of the uh modern territories anyway we're gonna step skip over a couple people mad dog buzz sawyer no <laughs> well we could talk about hall of famer but i mean on the video i saw during the hall of fame he was not called mad dog buzz sawyer he was bulldog buzz sawyer <laughs> explain that for the people he had a short short run maybe Maybe two months, maybe 
1984 when Vince was going after everybody and he bought yeah. Georgia. Bulldog Buzz Sawyer showed up, I believe, with Lou Albano as his manager. And they didn't call him Mad Dog. Mad Dog Vashon would come in shortly after that, but it's not like he got a massive push. But he was Bulldog Buzz Sawyer, and then he was gone, and he was back in Georgia and Mid-South and everywhere else he wrestled throughout the 80s as Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. But for a few months, he was Bulldog Buzz Sawyer. Oh, was he there? And Did they do that at the same time as, as Dynamite and Davey? I don't think so. I think it was earlier. I have to double check, but I he think went, it may He went earlier. before them. Because remember, they had a run, a very short run, where clearly Vince was trying to figure out what to do with them. And then they got disenchanted and signed with Baba and just said, fuck it. That's right. That's and right. Vince had to go to Japan, actually sit down with Baba, which got on the front page of all the wrestling magazines, which were weekly, which Inoki didn't like, because here's his partner, Vince, <laughs> shaking hands. And, you know, Baba's all smiling. Vince looks pretty... Stern as if he did not expect the Japanese wrestling press to invade this meeting. <laughs> and he had to like negotiate with Baba as part of getting back the British Bulldogs because they signed with Baba. Well, anyway, Mad Dog or Bulldog. Um, I don't know where this came from. Maybe some producer was a Buzz Sawyer fan. It was here's a guy that it wouldn't have hurt his image one bit if you'd have known exactly who he was. Because he was a asshole and a prick. It would, make it it would have made him an even more vicious heel. What an incredible, for that, I mean, I saw, I met him when he was like 19 years old. It, he worked in Tennessee briefly in like 1978, still had hair. And he was just a, he was a meat-headed kid, but he, what a fucking beast. He was a shooter. He was a physical freak. And by what early 80s you know he he was a, a incredible talent in the ring people play that clip or some of those clips where he would take that ridiculous bump out of the ring where you'd drop kick him and he'd just fly backwards head first through the ropes looking up and catch something to change his trajectory on the way through it was different every time because he just didn't give a fuck or when you would run his head into the post we worked with him and and his brother brett in Atlanta, when we first got there in 85, when you would run his head into the post, he would purposely not put his hand up and run his head forehead into the ring post hard enough where people could hear it hit and, and he would try to move the ring with it. And we, you know, you wonder why he was goddamn lunatic and on drugs or whatever the fuck. I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, the head into the post and then the lunatic or vice versa. Uh, but he was out of control. He didn't give a fuck. Sometimes he, the job guys at Atlanta TV hated him because he'd come in in shorts and flip flops on Saturday morning at TBS. And maybe it didn't know whether he'd even been in from Friday night and he wouldn't have a bag with him. And he'd borrow one guy's boots and other guy's trunks, the job guys who ain't going to say no to him. And then he'd work and then wear them out and leave in them. And they're like, what the f you know, I've told the story we had the fucking issue with him in that show in Georgia where he smacked me in the fucking face and I whacked him back with a racket. He got hot and came into that fucking trailer. It was me, Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, and goddamn, who was the referee? Was it Mike Fever, maybe? Uh, we, well, there's four of us and Dennis has a gun, so, you know, maybe it'll be even. But no, he was a piece of shit as a human being, but what an incredible fucking you know, physical performer and you believed him, you believed he was a lunatic and he was off his rocker because he was, and he was, he would, he's another one of these guys you could believe would go into business for themselves instantly. Just if you crossed them, even if wrestling was fake, which was true, he would. And so that's why he got over that. Uh, the, I can't remember who he's working with, but he was on that when they flair was booking and, and flair, liked him and brought him in and put him with Gary Hart. Um, I won't say liked him as a person, but you know, as a talent to book. And he did that flying fucking frog splash. And what was he? 250 pounds, even though he's only like five ten and just jacked up and landed on his wrist and snapped his wrist in half. And that was the end of that run. That was slaughter's slaughterhouse, uh, slaughter Sullivan slaughterhouse with Sullivan. Sl that's Cactus right. And buzz and Kevin is kind of the manager, although he wrestled too. 
That's right. And then did he come back later on with Gary then? Was he part of the No. That yeah. was that was it. He only came back. He did I that's... believe a couple of house shows in California cuz that's where he had his training school. Yeah. And then that was what early 91 or so and then early 92 is when he passed. Yeah, they found him on his front porch, OD'd, uh sitting in a chair. He was, was like what 33 years old or whatever. It's, it is uh, weird for me when I see a lot of these guys who, when I was a kid and I watched them and they died, they looked so old and now it's like, I'm older than all of them. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's strange. Well, somebody just, got him when Iron Sheik won the WrestleMania 17 gimmick battle Royal because he was so decrepit, he couldn't take a bump over the tops. So they let him win it. He was six years younger than Sting is now. Wow. Get, wow. I never thought of it that way. That's nuts. So there you go. <laughs> but anyway, the next in indictee, Paul Bosch. And this one is rich also because <laughs> obviously Paul Bosch is a Hall of Fame promoter and for all of the contributions to wrestling deserves to be in any Hall of Fame anywhere. But you just retweeted. Do you have that in front of you? Because I could paraphrase it. Oh, I'll pull it up. I'll pull it up now. Please pull it up. Because uh, the only people, this didn't make Paul's final cut of his book in this exact fashion. The only people that saw this were people that had the copy of the original manuscript, which I mentioned it on the uh, Back to the Territories video that I did. I read the the quote, and you just tweeted a copy from the Wrestling News Arcadian Vanguard files, but uh, Paul Bosch's quote on what should be on Vince McMahon's headstone after his dealings with Vince. Can you read that? Here it is from page 721 of Paul Bosch's manuscript. It was a lengthy tome. Promoters who had long concluded their business on a man-to-man -man basis found out that loyalty no longer meant what it once did. The sad discovery that a handshake was something on which you could no longer depend made suspicion an element of negotiation instead of friendship. I suggest this as an epitaph. Here lies the body of Vincent McMahon Jr., who destroyed faith in the handshake. So, as we can tell, Paul did not enjoy his dealings with Vince over the retirement show and Vince's involvement in Houston, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, but Paul should be in the Hall of Fame, without doubt. Without a doubt. And the last thing he would have wanted was Bruce Pritchard giving an induction speech, so <laughs> maybe this was for the best, the way they did this. Um, and the last two, here we go again. Um, Pistol Pez Watley. Pez was a great guy. Pez was a great, not only a great professional wrestler, but Pe Pez was a, a hotshot amateur at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. That's, and he got into the business um, by virtue of having a, a pretty, you know, a decent notoriety as an amateur in Tennessee. And he worked for Goulas. He worked for Phil Golden's All-Star Wrestling. And then finally uh, worked for uh, for not only Nick, but Jerry Jarrett on a, a few occasions. Um, he had a long career. Poffos, of course. The Poffos. That's well, that and that led to problems in uh, ever coming back to Memphis. But um, he's one of the jive tones with uh, Tiger Conway Jr. They had fun with it. Shaska Watley. Um, but he was a babyface. He was a heel. But he was never an attraction. I, he he was an attraction on the card, but he was never the main a main guy, a main guy, a featured guy, a pushed guy in a promotion that depended on him, I guess is the, you know, so I, I liked Pez, but this is another example of, I mean, Dory Dixon would mean more in, in a WWE hall of fame because of his sixties runs for Vince senior and that he was actually used higher on the cards up there at that point than maybe Pez was most places that he worked. Um, who just came up with that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, look, Pez had a couple of nice pushes in his career, Georgia, a few other yeah, places. He was good baby face in Georgia for Ole. 
But even the video they showed, all the footage they showed was pretty much maybe a few clips of him dancing as a giant tome, but him when he was a jobber in like 1990 for WWF. Yeah, well, they didn't even have footage to show of him. There is not a lot of of Pez's best decade in the business besides his brief 80s thing for Crockett would be the 70s where he was and he was featured on top for for Nick. But, you know, there's no footage and 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 you can't really find any. So but it just odd, odd choice. Okay, here's where the. uh, most controversy has come in apparently this year. Another inductee for the class of 2021, the final one, is Bruiser, Watley, Sawyer, Bosch, and Ethel Johnson. And Ethel Johnson, as and the story has come out now more uh, over the last few years of Ethel Johnson, Marva Scott, Babs Wingo, they were pioneer African American women wrestlers in the days before Mulan, the old, the probably what late forties, early fifties was the final days of the Mildred Burke era and Billy Wolf, uh, you know, really running women's wrestling. And they got in then and, and had careers in the fifties. And I think maybe to the early sixties, there about that time frame. point is not only did the, I mean, I don't know how Ethel Johnson, and they were all three sisters, by the way. Um, I don't know how Ethel Johnson got the nod over Marva Scott or Babs Wingo. But when they did the video, and I did not see this video, but I heard the uproar. They used footage of Sandy Parker as Ethel Johnson. Not, it wasn't like on purpose. They didn't know. Is this what I'm hearing? Well, there's a even bigger story because apparently someone in her family got on Twitter, a account known as Virgoat. At Miss Azerni, I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm not even going to try. But the tweet, which is even more problematic, is y'all need to fix this because if you're going to use my Aunt Ethel in the Hall of Fame, at least reach out to the family. Uh, And the video you guys used isn't her. Ethel Johnson was, all in caps, first black champion ever. If you're going to represent her, represent her correctly. If I was the family, I'd be pissed off too. Oh my God. So, so is, the, has there been any explanation of how the, and Sandy Parker is another black female wrestler that wrestled in the seventies. Decades later. Yeah. She was in California in the seventies. And they have a picture. Well, I've seen Sandy Parker wrestle live in Tennessee in the seventies. But the point is they have a picture of Ethel Johnson on their Hall of Fame legacy induction gimmick and Sandy Parker looks nothing like Ethel Johnson. Besides that, even if you weren't a wrestling expert, if you're just in television, you would know what a film from the fifties versus a piece of videotape from obviously the seventies, maybe even the eighties looked like. That's why I said, I didn't see this clip, so I don't know what they used, but it would be. It would almost have to be in color if it was Sandy Parker. And I'm not. I'm not. I'm not it saying was in that color. Now. Like, okay, they use. They use this. Somebody up there is not colorblind, but they've got some other fucking cognitive issue with color. They used color footage of a '70s girl wrestler wrestling to honor the first black women's champion from back in the '50s, early '50s. And they and uh, they couldn't figure that. There's a lot of clues there. So anyway, it, it, apparently, it, from what we would then be led to believe, somebody in that company said, oh, well, it's a pioneer female black wrestler. Let's look up a name. And then they didn't even bother to acknowledge the family. Well, is, or not acknowledge, but uh, uh, alert. Stooge off to, hey, we're putting your family member in our Hall of Fame. They don't even get the permission to use these names. How would they be able to use these names and pictures and likenesses of people that have never worked for them that the family didn't know, that nobody signed a release? How would that work? 
in a litigious company or a litigious minded company, they're always scared of getting sued and they got to have all their releases and their I's crossed and their T's dotted. Paul Bosch, did they let his family know? Well, who's it? Valerie just passed away. That was the, that why the estate sale took place. Yeah, and his and family Joe, is Peter Burkholz, and Bruce Pritchard's never going to let WWE contact Peter Burkholz. Yeah, and and Joey is 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 not able to. Joey's right now being decisions. taken care of. Yeah, right. So they're using these pictures and these names. Is there, they say they're honoring them, but I read in the Observer, I think, that they didn't even contact Barbara Goodish when they put Bruce Brody in. <laughs> So they just figure that everybody ever in wrestling is now in the public domain. That sounds exactly like a WWE argument. I don't know yep. that they exactly think that, but I would think so, yeah. Well. I'm looking at some of these other legacy inductee classes. They're just all over the place. Like, you can't even argue like one specific person just because the whole class is all over. Here's one. Listen to this. Buddy Rose, Shinma, Primo <laughs> Carnera, Jim Barnett, Wahoo McDaniel, Bruiser Brody, S.D. Jones, Luna Vashon, Joe Cohen, and Toru Tanaka. Joe Cohen. I don't know who he is. Maybe an executive for WWE? I knew Ed Cohen. I don't know Joe Cohen. It says Joe Cohen here on their official graphic. What does he look like? He looks like a Joe Cohen. Uh, <laughs> here's another Hall of Fame. Listen to this, the legacy uh, class. Stan Stasiak. Jim Londis, Rufus R. Jones, Dara Singh, El Santo, Cora Combs, Lord Alfred Hayes, Sputnik Monroe, Hiro Matsuda, Boris Malenko. That's just like you put clipped names out of newspaper ads from across the years and put them in a drum and spun them and then just dump some out. They, they, the common denominator is everybody was in the wrestling business, except for <laughs> Joe Cohen. We're not sure. We're not, we don't know about Joe Cohen. We don't know about Joe. Crazy. <sighs> <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. All right. And we're talking about those other things being racist. What would be more racist than we have a black female wrestler who's, by all accounts, you would say a Hall of Famer, like you said, a trailblazer. She should be in the Hall of Fame. All right, let's just find footage of any black female wrestler we can and hope no one notices. That's fucked up. I got to think, I would like to think that they were just stupid and didn't know, but here's the, all their shit's labeled. All their tapes, the, the, they have the, 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 what do they call him? The curator or the archivist or whatever. Every, how would they, how, unless they just said, let's find a black girl wrestler, how would they make that mistake? I have no idea. Like you said, wow. everything's labeled. And I don't think... And if it, ain't, if it ain't labeled, then why would you think it's Ethel Johnson? Oh, it's not labeled. It must be Ethel. And there would be no footage from the Sandy Parker era that would be mislabeled. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't Ethel Johnson working on that show. It was Velvet McIntyre. I wrote the yeah, wrong thing. Yeah, that's right. But we get Velvet and Ethel mixed up all the time because Velvet was from Ireland and she was blonde and... <laughs> Ethel lived 20 years ago. <sighs> well, Jim, one thing I did send you earlier this week, because I started receiving it from a lot of the listeners, is apparently recently on one of his website's shows, I guess they're podcasts, Dave Meltzer was talking about AEW's booking problems, is the way I'll put it. Things that we've been talking about, but all of a sudden Dave is at the point now where he has to address certain things, and what he thinks the problems are. Did you have a chance to check that out? I did. I listened. Uh, it was, it was very lengthy. He used a lot of words, but many of them, the same word over and over again, but nevertheless, isn't it kind of like the downfall of every civilization, the, 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 uh, the press secretary or the official statements, they have to start acknowledging what the people are, out in the streets protesting about they finally have to start acknowledging it that's the beginning of the end dave Meltzer has had to acknowledge what everybody else has been looking at with their own eyeballs for the past however long that this show's been on the air that is 
not not necessarily wrong with the show, but that doesn't make sense about the show. That doesn't that the reason the show is not growing. That the reason that people are are starting to find chinks in the armor. It's it's stuff that we talked about this a few weeks ago on one of the programs that a lot of this has had to do with smoking the hopium and people wanting desperately something to be true. They've wanted uh, an alternative wrestling promotion to Vince McMahon, and haven't we all? We all have in one form or another. But most of the wrestling fans that liked wrestling by now, as we've seen by the numbers, have gone on to do something else because wrestling doesn't look like wrestling anymore. And the people who still like the concept of wrestling, whatever it is in their mind, have been so desperate for something else besides Vince that this had to be it. They had convinced themselves it was going to be it. And especially the worst, the worst people, the, the people most into this, most willing to drink the Kool-Aid, most willing to give anything a pass because it's a different promotion because their favorite wrestlers were the Cucamonga Kids and Twinkle Toes. So it was going to have to be good. They're going to show the world. They're going to shock the world. And it's been a year and a half, and the the big explosion, no pun intended, was a popcorn fart. The exploding ring match was a metaphor for, you know, AEW. It wasn't what they thought it was going to be, and they so desperately wanted it to be that they were seeing it until it started getting worse because now. Folks, if you haven't noticed, this is the downhill slide beginning of the shelf life of an amateur booker. Because think about this, and I know he things always change, and you don't always get the talent you want, and COVID happens. But a guy that's going to start a wrestling company and book it, He's got a bunch of, just like a band that's going to fucking sign with a, a record label and put out an album. The first album's the easiest because they've already got songs written. And then if they're any good, they got to follow those up. And the albums get harder. They had all those songs saved up when nobody wanted to hear their fucking songs. They were all in their head. They were all on paper. They just couldn't do them. Now they can do them. Brian, you know where I'm going with it, with the music business. And then all of a sudden the pressure is, oh shit, what do I do now? The shit we saw the first year of AEW was, was Tony Khan's good shit. That's what he had saved up. That's what he was thinking about all that time he wanted to start a wrestling company. Now he's run out of shit. It's just week to week, and it's falling apart fast. Every booker has a shelf life. I was burnt in OVW after five years. I was burnt in Smoky Mountain after four years. And I did a lot more shows, and they were all better than Tony Khan. Because we were doing weekly television and house shows, blah, blah, blah. Dusty got burnt. Jerry Jared would switch off. Lawler would just get uninterested. Every booker, you because you you run out of, you just run out of enthusiasm for thinking of things, and you have to take a break and stop constantly thinking about things so then you can start thinking about things when you're not trying. It's like trying to take a shit when you don't have to. Brian, go take a shit right now. So uh, anyway, Dave Meltzer now, of all people, even though he did it very nicely and very diplomatically, and it, as never I said, said Tony Khan, I mean, that's never the thing. mentioned the name of the guy he was talking about that was doing the booking that had the problems. Never mentioned Tony Khan's name, but just said, yeah, AEW has some problems with their booking. But I noted a couple, and I want to I will see what you think of them. He's, he said one of their problems is they have too much talent all at once. 
And because a lot of people are complaining what they had 60 or 70 something different human beings exposed in some fashion in out of the ring, whatever promo on their most recent television program, but they don't have too much talent. They don't have enough talent. They have too many people on the roster. And all this talk for a year and a half, well, we have so much talent, so it's hard to get everybody TV time and get everybody over. Well, that's your fault, dumb shit. Number one, as I said, you don't have too much talent. You got too many people. Number two, the reason why you don't concentrate on every jack leg on your roster is because then whenever it's like the same thing that shit stain did wrong. It made all the underneath guys happy as schoolgirls with shiny new vibrators to get talk or be on TV. And it also not only uses up your time, but your thought processes and your resources because everybody shouldn't be involved in something because if everybody's involved in something, everything's the same. Involve your top people in things and let your middle and bottom people sometimes just wrestle. Sometimes they win. Sometimes more, more often they lose. Every once in a while, you might hear a comment or two, but they're not being pushed right now. They're not in a position to be pushed, and they don't need to be pushed. Concentrate on your top guys. Have them on every week, working and talking, and in VTRs, and in goddamn videos and whatever else sprinkle the other guys in around to fill in the cracks don't have 70 people on your television program but it's the booker's fault because he assembles that crew a booker has to not only know and recognize talent but know which talents to interact those talents with and how not to have 70 people on tv so nobody gets over and everybody's sitting around and you don't just Use the same guy for a fucking year. You ro you use your top guys for a year. You rotate your underneath guys every so often. Uncle Dave says the heavy use of blood is running off women. <clears throat> I guess women are bigger pussies these days than they used to be. Is that a pun? Why does Dave think that women are so faint hearted? I think what's running the women off is women are less tolerant of stupidity and silliness in general. And the fact is, is that there are no men on that program that any woman would be attracted to for any reason. A few of them may look good until you realize that all they do when they get home is play video games. They don't want to fucking find the little man in the boat. They want to find their fucking joystick. It didn't happen in the 80s or the 70s or anywhere else. D Dusty Rhodes had some of the bloodiest cards on record, even for the NWA in the 1980s, and the crowd was 50% or more female because they wanted to fuck every single one of the baby faces and most of the heels. And in some cases, they did. They were men. Real adult men fighting, which sometimes women, I've been told, find fascinating. And my market research from female fans that I have known over my life that enjoyed wrestling and I still keep in touch with basically say, yeah, these guys are a bunch of fucking pussies. So I don't think the blood is running the women off because it hadn't happened anywhere else in any other territory in, hi in history. I think it's a silly program that's stupid and doesn't make any sense, and it's running men and women off. And also the fact that there are no men on that roster, that the, there are more attractive women-to-men fans than there are attractive men-to-women fans on that program. And I'm not talking about the way they look. I'm talking about the way they act. Um, there was mention at, oh, well, they need that second show on TNT to spread the talent out. Did you hear that, Brian? I believe so. If the first show isn't any good, why is the second one going to be any good? If the first show can't get anybody over, why is the second one good? When you go into a restaurant and you order a meal, and it comes out and it tastes like dog shit. 
Do you say, I want my money back and go somewhere else? Or do you say, you know, this tastes like goddamn dog food. I'd rather have something else. And they bring you some cat food. (sighs) Dave was giving ideas of what AEW could do as a promotion. They could do this, or they could do that, or they could do... Yes, they could. They could certainly do that if they knew how. If their booker knew how, if a frog had wings, he wouldn't bump his ass on the ground. But the talent don't know how to do it, and they have no guidance. Because they've been petted on and made over and told that they're fabulous, and they have creative freedom, and they can do whatever they want, and nobody has pointed out except me their shortcomings in the way that they're presented and the way they work that now everybody else is starting to pick up on a year and a half later. Um, imagine this, Brian, he said, there's too many seconds and managers, too much interference and too many groups exchanging members. <laughs> you should keep your featured talent on the air as TV regulars and don't shoot angles and then just drop the angles. This is Dave's advice. That's basically what we've been saying for forever. What? I'm not even taking fucking credit. Like I had some epiphany. Well, this is what you should do. Everybody that's ever been around a wrestling business knows that's what you should do. And they've been saying it except for the people who wanted this to be fantastic and refused to acknowledge it when it wasn't. And, and this uh, uncle Dave thinks that the Thunderdome set And the better looking show and the better looking, you know, the atmosphere, the higher budget is what saved Raw from losing to AEW in the ratings during the pandemic. Now, this is where we go back to weed being legal in California. What if a better looking set doesn't mean, as we've seen in wrestling For years, the better looking set or the better looking TV show doesn't make people watch that show if they don't want to fucking watch it. Now they do get a, a, um, a sense of the number one promotion by having the names and seeing the flash and the glitz and blah, blah, blah. But that Vince upgraded the production in the 80s during his expansion and created the thought that he was the number one promotion because he had all the fucking talent too and in the 90s the way he won the war was not with all the goddamn bells and whistles they put on raw but with having the better talent and so he thinks that somehow this a annoying look at dude do you know anybody that likes besides the people that that's picture may be on the fucking thing likes that Thunderdome and thinks that's easy on the eyes to watch and that's what would have saved Raw from losing to AEW in the fucking ratings. I just know I don't like it, but I guess it maybe looks better than having an empty room with no one there. Well, But it's still a bit much, I think. It's still a bit much, and they didn't have to have no one there either. They're the ones that didn't do AEW, at least did that. They put some people out there to make some noise, even if they were fucking paid fans that they had to fucking test and blah, 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 whatever the fuck. Anyway, I don't think the better looking set means the ratings. I think the better looking talent means the ratings. But weed's legal in California. I'm in love with Mary Jane. She's my main thing. She makes me feel all right. She makes my heart sing. And when I'm feeling low, it comes as no surprise. Turns me on with her love. Takes me to paradise. Do you love me, Mary Jane? Oh, 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 do you, do you, do you, do you, do you? I'm in love with Mary Jane. I'm not the only one. If Mary want to play around, I'll let her have her fun. She's not the kind of girl that you can just tie down. She likes to spread her love and turn your head around. Uncle Dave. Let me say something I was going to say before that rather unfortunate musical interlude. Unfortunate. Your singing is quite unique. I must say. It's a bird in this world. 
But that's what my Aunt Lola used to say. You are a bird in this world. Go ahead. Dave jumped on me on Twitter, whatever it was, a couple months ago. We talked about it on the show because I said, I understand why people like these matches. However, you have to be nuts to watch this show and think the booking and formatting is acceptable because it isn't. And he, you know, had to jump in there. I didn't tag him in it. And we went back and forth a little bit on it. But that's been my point all along. You know, Booker of the Year is ridiculous. Promoter of the Year, you've argued. I actually think Matchmaker of the Year. He knows how to put on pay-per-view matches that will get over 100,000 buys, but there's nothing on the TV show week by week that does anything to help any of those matches other than announcing one of them. But, you know, I do, I'm i sorry. I can't go with he knows how to put on pay-per-view matches that people will buy because... The, the fanatical core audience, and, and it's great. Every company has had a fanatical core audience of varying sizes. It's great to have one. But the fanatical core audience of AEW, because of their dedication to proving themselves right and everyone wrong, 100, 125, 150,000 of those people will buy Literally, if they just all squatted and took a shit in the ring, they would buy it. It started with the crowdfund, the most successful crowdfunding event in all of wrestling that started this whole thing. They got 10,000 people to go to the fucking, where was the Sears Center in Chicago? It was crowdfunding. Those people wanted the promotion to happen and willed it, and they refused to now say, ah, shit. Look what they've fucking done. This was supposed to be great. They see it as great. And and some of them, to some of them, it is great because people that age, it's been a while since they've they've seen wrestling presented properly. They don't know anything else. They don't get it. They don't understand why anyone would have ever taken this seriously. It's all supposed to be a joke to them because that's what they've seen over the last few years. That's what it's been. So they don't understand. They think, wow, they're doing a good job. This is what wrestling is. All those tables and thumbtacks. Wow. Uh, But for people who actually liked this, when it was still somewhat a respectable activity, they're fucking offended by this stupidness. And, and so I can, I can see where the, the, Newest fan and the core fan and the, and people who like Japanese anime would get into this as a quirk because of Twinkle Toes' fetishes or whatever. Um, it's a whole different crowd, and they're going to accept that. But for wrestling fans and or any large amount of people, they look at the show and go, well, this is just fucking stupid. And, and I don't see how you can be a level... Even if you're not a person... Whoever liked or watched wrestling, if you just tried to watch this, you wouldn't understand it because it doesn't make sense from week to week. There's no focus. That's the thing. Like Dave keeps pointing to the women thing. And there's a legitimate thing there because that's the one. The reason Dave is pointing to that is because it's provable based on the ratings. That's the one rating, the one demo that has dropped completely off for AEW or women. Now, again, it's a small audience that they use to generate this giant rating. It's Well, yes, it's a sample and statistical and they extrapolate. But here's the I still say women have uh, less tolerance for stupid and foolishness. And also, women don't have to spend any time whatsoever trying to get laid. But the guys do. So, the, but I don't even think that's the issue. Again, everyone's focusing now on the, the women thing. The but guys the, are. I mean, you can look at the look at the live events when they still had crowds. Women don't want to see this shit anymore because it's stupid and fake, and none of the guys will fuck them. So it's a bunch of fucking guys. What I was going that, to say, all right, was that the women issue to me isn't the biggest issue. The biggest issue still comes back to the formatting and booking of that show. There's no focus. They have yeah. so many guys on there. Nothing makes any sense. Segment by segment is put together horribly. The same exact thing will happen on the same episode, a few segments apart. And, you know, when you really start to think about it, and a lot more in the last few weeks, and Dave, in his own way, kind of opened the door towards a lot more of the criticism being valid and out there. 
But people are now pointing out all these things, all the QT Marshall chasing the bunny, and then all of a sudden, here's my wife. Cody Rhodes, what has Cody done since Brody Lee? He was out there when Sting debuted. I had to be reminded of that. I don't even he remember. He disappeared. What was that? Why was Cody involved with that? The whole buildup to the Shaq thing did nothing, and they seemingly got no benefit of Shaq after the fact, just like they got no benefit of Mike Tyson the first <laughs> time after the fact. And at least week one this week, they didn't get any benefit in the ratings for that. The show just is really poorly put together. None of the booking makes any sense. I think if they did those pay-per-views and whatever matches they had planned out, those are the matches. And instead of the TV show with traditional wrestling booking by Tony Khan or his version of it, which is a joke, if they just did those Road 2 specials, where you talk about, you have a narrator saying, this man hates this person because of this, and this happened, and you just have them sit down and do interviews, I think you'd get the same exact buy rate. You I would. don't think they're getting any extra people to buy the show, buy the pay-per-views, based off Dynamite. Because it's a bad show. People are waking up to it now and saying it. It's a really badly put together show. And as far as promoter of the year or booker of the year or whatever, promoters and bookers, you've got to know your product. You also have to have timing and know when to pull the trigger on something. I just leave you with this. Vince McMahon paid Mike Tyson $2 million and turned the, the tide of the wrestling war and got Steve Austin over as the biggest box office attraction in wrestling. AEW brings Mike Tyson in. He goes to sleep at ringside holding the belt on the first show. And the second show, he's on. They lose in the ratings to NXT. I, timing and presentation means a lot. But, you know, again, if you're going to criticize AEW, and right now they need to hear it. And if they're getting it from their biggest supporters and people who have traditionally not seen, said bad things about AEW, then it's important. And you would think AEW would listen. But if you're going to say it and you're going to point out the problems with the show, say who's the cause of the problems. Just say Tony Khan. You, you don't have to admit he's in over his head. You don't have to say he's not good at it. But you could say whose fault it is that the show's formatted and booked the way it's been the last several weeks. It's Tony Khan. Wait a minute. The last set. Don't put the qualifier of the last several weeks on it. If you want to blame somebody for the way the show has been booked and but formatted. But if your argument, I know, I agree with you. But if your argument is that. The big problem is the loss of female viewers, specifically since the Britt Baker Thunder Rosa match. If that is your argument, and my argument would be there's been bigger problems with that show for a very long time, and now more people are noticing it. But if your argument is it's a female problem since that specific match, then you need to point out who it is who actually has been putting the shows together since that match. And it's Tony Khan. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's in over his head. They have two different shows on YouTube which apparently have like 14 matches at times on each show. They have so many people there. There's no focus on anything. There's no main focus throughout the show. Man, something big happened in Smoky Manor, Mid-South, and I hate to go back to those, but Mid-South Wrestling did things right. Something big happens, they bring it up throughout the show. They go back to another recap of it, another clip. And this show is just something happens in a segment. Let's go to the next segment. Something else happened here. Let's go to the next one. No one does a promo without being interrupted. No one. I said it this week hey, on the you, show. You can't, you can't grieve forever now. Somebody gets fucking decapitated by an 18-wheeler. Let's go to the break and come back with those wonderful battling midgets. As soon as the first promo came on the screen, I said, I'll bet that someone's going to come into this promo. I bet it happens every single promo on the show. Every promo. Someone's talking, they get five words out, someone else's music hits, or someone attacks them. Well, let's not spoil the uh, review later on in the program. But anyway, that was... Uh, Booker of the year. Give me a fucking break. Yeah, a sad least, uh, indictment of wrestling and wrestling bookers in 2021. If someone who has no idea how to put together a show is Booker of the year. He has no idea. And he thinks he does. That's the thing that should scare people. He believes he's got this. He believes this is in his wheelhouse and he's good at it. And there are people in that company afraid to say anything, and you don't understand why. They're getting a lot of money to, you know, cheer at ringside or whatever the fuck to do. When I don't know TV. how that some people can muffle their fucking screams of anguish, though. I don't know how somebody hasn't just cracked up and said, What the fuck are you doing? They grab a white claw and they shut the fuck up. They sit down. That's what they do. They collect their money and they go for the ride. A lot of people see this, the good and the bad, and say, hey, 
This is better than life in WWE. At least I'm happy. I may be dealing with a fool, but I'm happy. I'm not stressed and angry. I don't want to choke Triple H. I'm okay. He's a fool, but he's my fool. And he lets me do all the stupid shit I've always wanted to do. And I work two days every two weeks. I'm loving in Florida on the beach in Jacksonville. I'm loving life. That's you ever been to Jacksonville, Florida? I've driven through it. I've never stopped in it. It's it's not exactly fucking Honolulu. Honolulu. Anyway, by the way, Honolulu is much better. No, I'm saying even that. You know, you go to Maui, you go to Kauai. You don't want to stay in Waikiki. It's not. Well, I'm just saying, anywhere in Hawaii. How did we get started on this Hawaiian, Brian? Anyway, Uncle Dave, thank you for your comments. There you go. Why'd you rip that? Just so I wouldn't think about it again. <laughs> All righty. Um, apparently, we're going to be watching WrestleMania this weekend, and we're going to be reporting on it on the drive through that will be out on Tuesday. Is this correct? I believe so. That is the plan. I will admit. Uh, we're recording this early on the day this is coming out, Saturday the 10th. And this morning, I was like, all right, you know, got to wake up, record the show, get things going, get things edited, work with Jace, work with Travis. And then it hit me, oh, fuck, WrestleMania starts tonight. <clears throat> I completely forgot. I just think Sunday pay-per-view, but now it's two nights. Uh, I have been, let's see, I was a part of WrestleMania in 94. 95, 96. Uh, then I obviously it was on the creative team for 97. I was a producer on 98 and 99. And then I wrestled on 2001. 2001. Yeah. And I remember it always being a fairly big deal. <laughs> and, and boy, uh, how times have changed. I, I mean, just... Go back and look at the cards that from especially the late 90s when Vince was really, you know, competition was on the heels, but he was trying. And then the new guys, well, we just mentioned, you know, Austin and Michaels with Tyson and Rock and Austin and just but just up and down the card, every match at that at least the years that I had you know, it was around and, and had knowledge of what was going on beforehand. They, even if they weren't great matches, they had something behind them. They were, they had meaning. They had been planned, announced. They were, they were different. There wasn't just 18 multiple man matches for the sake of it. Uh, people anticipated, you know, the, the blow offs of these big programs or angles or feuds or the resolution or the first big match or whatever it was. And now they just, it, it's just put together like another week's raw because they don't really care. They've got the, the cock, the money coming in from the cock and from the networks and they don't have to sell any tickets. Well, they're going to for this one, but you know, it's not really a priority. I remember Vince used to constantly be on the phone with Ed Cohen or somebody in event booking. What's the advance looking like, pal? How are we doing down there? We need to do something to move some extra seats. Or, you know, they do a promotion. We got to make sure that San Antonio's full. It's the Alamo Dome. Let's give them a cheap general admission or whatever. Not only the live event, but the television production and the, most importantly, the matches behind it, the product he had to sell. He would see that WrestleMania main event. I want it to be Taker and fucking whoever, whatever the case. And it would be months out and you would work toward that and you would have that uppermost in your mind as to, you know, how you got there. And now she's, eh, eh, ha. What are the WrestleMania matches? I can't really call any of them. Well, let's start, Jim, with night one of WrestleMania. What number is this? WrestleMania 37. 37. They should have brought the Bushwhackers in. I actually hate them not using the numbers anymore. Now it's just like WrestleMania Tampa. Do they really? I hadn't paid any attention. Yeah, Vin, apparently Vince, <laughs> it's one of those vince -isms, Oh, God. Decided he didn't want numbers anymore because it made it sound old. Oh, for fuck's 
and they got rid of the numbers. Meanwhile, enjoy the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet it really hurt UFC once they got past 250 or whatever. <sighs> well, here it anyway. is. Anyway. The card for WrestleMania Night 1. I'm going to go in the order that they're listed here on Wikipedia. For the WWE Championship, Bobby Lashley with MVP versus Drew McIntyre. So is this the, this is the main event? We're going from the top down. Uh, well, it's not the match on last. I guess maybe it's the main event because it's the heavyweight championship. But it's but not it's going not on, on last. Not they've already announced the match that's on last. We'll get there in a moment. In All a right. tag team match, the Miz. Oh, wait a minute! Hold on! Hold on! Oh, okay. just, so Lashley and and uh, and old Drew. That Bobby's been looking great. Drew can work. Uh, if they don't do anything stupid or cinematic, that might be a pretty good match. Hopefully it won't go 30 minutes. A tag team extravaganza, The Miz and John Morrison versus Damian Priest and Bad Bunny. Okay, it's back to being a tag team match. Yeah. They originally said it was going to be a single match. One guy was hurt or something happened. Was Priest possibly injured? They didn't know if he was going to be able to make it. I don't know, to be honest. Ah, whatever. But it's back to being a tag. Thank God. Um, I guess Bugs has been working out with everybody. So I'm torn on this because do you want the guy to go out and be good in his first match? You, a, a Ronda Rousey you do because she was a high-level professional athlete. Somebody from another form of athletics or sport you you do – because that's not, you know, making the business look easy, but a rapper. So he's trained for three months or what? If he goes out and looks great, then doesn't that demean everything that everybody does? Well, that makes it look easy. Look how good Bugs is. So, I mean, yeah, for whatever reason, people listen to this fucking guy's music. We've gone over that. I don't know how the fuck anybody would choose to listen to the noise this man makes. But he's a big star, so he's going to get him some attention. But it's still a, a fucking singer they're training to, to be a wrestler. I don't think he should be good. I think they should have done something to him that he needed to get a big, bad wrestler like Damian Priest as a partner to take care of him and let Priest basically kick the shit out of both Miz and Morrison, let them get, uh, you know, a little steam on, on bugs to put him in jeopardy because people like him. And of course, let him do a couple of things that a normal person could do possibly with priests help that, you know, uh, fucking knocks the heels on their ass, but let priest carry the fucking ball and beat the tag team and celebrate with, with bugs. Don't, but they're obviously, you know, they're going to have him let him have the thrill of a lifetime by doing the splash off the top and probably a dive and intricate spots that it should take you years of being a pro athlete to master. And the whole thing will, you know, it'll probably come off good and it'll be Gaga for the business. For the Raw Tag Team Championship, the champions, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, the New Day. Versus AJ Styles and Omos. Amos is going to wrestle? Omos. Edward James almost, Omos. He's, all, he's almost going to wrestle? <laughs> I think that's, that's how you pronounce it. O-M-O-S. Well, see who the fuck. What kind of fucking name is that? See, that's, there's, put that on the marquee. This guy's eight feet tall. They want to get him over as a giant. The Undertaker versus Omos. He almost graduated wrestling school, so yeah. they put him on WrestleMania. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I you know, uh, I'm sure AJ and the other guys will be athletic. Hopefully, this guy can fucking go. But it, why wouldn't you, if you're debuting this giant, why wouldn't you put him in a handicap match and let him beat two fucking guys? I don't know, but that's just me. A steel cage match, months in the making. <laughs> Braun Strowman versus Shane McMahon. <sighs> We've said it before. I love Shane. But I will reiterate one more time. In 
What universe does the 50-something-year-old son of the bill- evil billionaire owner who should be presented as a rich kid uh, be able to hang competitively physically with any of the people? They, even though Shane is a legitimate tough guy, right? He's got balls of steel. Why should he be doing that with anybody, much less Braun Strowman? It's just crazy. And he's going to take a bump and end up hurting himself sooner or later. He's, he's got... He's a multi, multi millionaire. Why the fuck does he need to drop an elbow off the top rope through the table? Shane McMahon's balls of steel are sponsored by Manscaped. <laughs> Manscaped.com used a promo code JCE, but no, I um I can't explain why anyone is interested in this feud, which has seen green slime and Elias. And and calling Braun Strowman stupid, which is like <laughs> calling water wet and sun hot. But you just don't say it. Who who doesn't say it? Shane is calling the baby face stupid and dumb, and he's acting stupid and dumb. Yeah. There's train noises. Yeah. Hey, at least birds aren't flying out of Braun Strowman's ass. It could have been worse. He he'd he probably happy he got to choo choo. Choo choo. In a grudge match, I assume, because I have no other idea why they would be wrestling. Seth Rollins versus Cesaro. What are they mad about? I don't know. I mean, on paper, that should be a well-worked match. Yeah. But I don't know what their issue may or may not be. Remember, everybody was always wondering when it was Hogan and Andre. They were wondering, why are they mad? We, we don't really know. Then we have a tag team turmoil match. Oh, boy. Where the winners will receive a WWE Women's Tag Team Championship match on night two. The teams are Lana and Naomi, Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose, the Riot Squad of Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot, Natalia and Tamina, and finally, Billy Kay and Carmella. Okay, I recognize some of those names. Is it everybody in it at the same time, or is it staggered entrances? How long could that thing possibly See, go? I don't know, but I want to say this here publicly now. I want to make a plea. I want to beg you, please do not skip this match. No, I was about when you... Whatever when you, it is, it has no, to be. <laughs> no, when when you <laughs> mentioned that match, I was like, well, goddamn, at least something that I can skip that nobody will give a shit about. I'm not going to watch six girl tag teams have some kind of clusterfuck unless they're all naked and the film is from Germany. Okay, will you? So that's not I'm that's not going to be watched. Well, beyond the tag team turmoil match, the final match of night 1, the match that I told you before has been announced as the final match on the night for the WWE SmackDown Women's Championship. Oh. The champion Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair. The last match, not even for the undisputed women's championship, but for the just one of the women's championships. The last match on WrestleMania is Sasha Banks and Bianca Bella. Think Andre Hogan, Rock, Austin, fucking Undertaker, fucking Michaels. The women's SmackDown title in the last. And I can't skip that one or you'll be mad at me, right? You can't skip that one if you're skipping the tag team turmoil match. I'll skip the tag team turmoil match. I'll watch that. But do me a favor, at least like zoom past it so if like, anyone has a big botch, you can stop and see it. You wh- you can't really tell the botches on fast forward because when you watch at regular speed, all the matches look like they're on fast forward. So they look normal if you put them on fast forward. They're going so fast, you really ca- I, I'll see what I can do. Well, night two is another packed night of WWE sports entertainment action. The matches for the Raw Women's Championship, the champion Asuka versus Rhea Ripley. Okay, I will watch that. That will be good. I guarantee If Rhea Ripley does not win the match, I will fucking take an axe to the goddamn television. Please don't do that because there's another several matches to go. For night two uh, of WrestleMania, that's including... That's what I'm afraid of. But no, in all seriousness, for fuck's sake, are they going to botch her up again or they they need to get going with Rhea Ripley and it, or it's it then people are going to get used to her as just being somebody that's just hanging around. It's ridiculous. Somebody doesn't come along like that every day. 
I have to think Rhea Ripley will win because they blew it having her lose last year to Charlotte. And that killed that killed a year. Yeah. That killed all of yeah. her momentum. Well, match two, it's nice to see a match where they don't feel the need to go to gimmicks. They could just have a straight wrestling match. Randy Orton versus The Fiend Bray Wyatt <laughs> with Alexa Bliss. That's actually going to be in the ring. It says singles match. That's what I'm thinking. They've already been burned. They've already died and come back. And I, been I, gotta, holograms I, gotta, and, I gotta be honest. I probably am not going to watch any of that because I don't want to see that fucking fiend bullshit. I don't want to see Alexa bliss shooting flames out of her ass. I'm disgusted with Randy for everything I've seen him do in this thing. I, and it, by the way, where was the plastic surgery? Did they show him getting the plastic surgery from when he was burned and then he's not scarred? Because the fiend came back from being burned alive and he was all melted. But Randy wasn't, so he must have got plastic surgery. I, I can't promise I'm going to watch this because I just don't care about any of those people. Well, Jim, every now and then in wrestling history, a new match pops up and you go, wow, I've never heard of that. What will it be? I think you probably remember the Roman Gladiator death match. Yes, yes. From Los Angeles. It was, wow, what is that? What could that be? Well, here on WrestleMania night two, we have Big E, the Intercontinental Champion, defending against Apollo Crews in a Nigerian drum fight. Oh, boy. Uh, is so the, I don't watch their show either. The Nigerian drum is some sort of weapon they'll be using, or this is going to be like Gene Krupa versus Buddy Rich, just a drum battle. <laughs> well, but now, or, or, but, but maybe they're going to beat each other with the Nigerian drum sticks. Cause you know what you see in the movies, they're they got the fucking it's like a, a hammer you hit a xylophone with on the on the tom toms there. So maybe they're going to hit each other over the head with a those. mallet. Well, it's not really a mallet. A mallet is a big giant thing. It looks like a a keg on the end of a stick, and it's it's bigger. These are the xylophone things and the drum things. They're they're just little round things like golf balls on the end of boom 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 boom. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they'll drum up some interest. Maybe they'll have a glockenspiel. We'll find out. But other matches, Jim, on the show, another big singles match, a grudge match, 20-something years in the making. It's a Jim Cornette death match. No, I kid. <laughs> Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn, who will be accompanied by Logan Paul. Who is this fucking Logan Paul? I keep seeing that he's a celebrity that has boxing matches. Who? Uh, what? made him a celebrity and who how do um, why am i supposed to know who he is or what he's done i will admit at 41 years old he is one of these names i always see but i never pay too much attention because he has kind of seemed like a moron but who knows but i believe his brother is a child actor who maybe was on disney channel or nickelodeon one of those two channels and he started doing stuff to get attention on youtube and maybe some other social media platforms and now he's doing boxing i believe he challenged was it Conor McGregor he was trying to fight? <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but he will now be here in the corner of Sami Zayn, a grudge match years in the making against Kevin Owens. I'm sure that they're both just tickled pink, and I just feel so bad for whoever their producer is. Because I guarantee you he's going to be mainlining Excedrin for the fucking entire time he's in the building with those two for a match at WrestleMania. Well, Jim, anything could happen in WWE, and of course, on this show, the U.S. Championship will be defended. The champion, Riddle, versus <laughs> Sheamus. What about if the fucking birds fly out of Riddle's ass and get stuck in Sheamus's mustache? I wonder what that would look like. We may find out. Can anybody care any less about anything than Riddle? against Sheamus is that apparently Vince likes Riddle is what I've been told <sighs> well I don't know why they even let him back on television after he fucked up that live shot on Raw but uh I would encourage him to find another line of work I don't think he gets it at all well Jim only two more matches on night two of Wrestlemania 37 thank god 
for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship. Oh, for fuck's sake. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler versus, excuse me, with Reginald, the tag team champions, versus the winners of the tag team turmoil from night one of WrestleMania. Let me do an imitation of what I'm going to sound like when that match comes on. But Reginald's in the match. Fuck Reginald. Fuck his Cirque du Soleil bullshit. And finally, a triple threat match for the WWE Universal Championship. The champion, Roman Reigns, with Paul Heyman and Jey Uso, versus Edge, versus Daniel Bryan. I wish it was a single match against one or the other. It's a three-way, so it's probably, with the guys involved, it's not going to be rotten, but I'm going to care so much less because it's a three-way. Um, but at least that sounds like a WrestleMania main event for fuck's sake. Instead of, well, that's a lot of stuff we're going to have to watch. Um, remember when Vince used to not want to do the stuff that every single other promotion ever always did. And now he is multiple person or team matches for no reason that are always rotten. You can't do them right. Nobody gets over. It takes a specific personal issue between three people or elsewise you fucked up your whole goddamn match layout and the baby face heel dynamic is screwy. But is that they don't want people to boo Edge because I've I Yes, read they do. Some, He's the heel, I think. Well, but I think he just came back in v- from a fucking career-ending injury six months ago. And they turned him. Remember, he turned on Daniel Bryan in the match that you skipped after the Alexa Bliss-Randy well, Orton Well, no, match. I skipped it because I was so offended by Alexa Bliss and Randy Orton that I didn't want to see any more of their fucking shit. So I know, but what kind of insanity is that? When Roman Reigns was a babyface, they were afraid the people alive would boo him, but now he's a heel. So now they're supposed to boo him. But now I read that they were afraid that they would cheer Roman Reigns against Edge unless they put Daniel Bryan in or whatever the fuck. But what fucking moron thought it'd be a good idea to bring a a legend back after a seven-year forced retirement due to injury and have him come back and actually get hurt again and be out and come back again and then triumph over all that adversity and then switch heel? What fucking idiot? What I should I should use another synonym for idiot. What writer would think that's a good idea? One with Kennedy as his middle name. <sighs> oh god. The writers are only delivering what Vince wants, especially with the main events, and you know that. It must be the steroids. Over a cumulative period of time. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think it's the concussions after the age of fifty. That's entirely possible because that's, you know, not a time when you ought to be damaging your brain. So that's WrestleMania, eh? No, not WrestleMania A. WrestleMania 37. A? That'll be when they go back to Toronto. Well, folks, (laughs) we'll be talking about that on the (laughs) drive-thru in some, some detail or other. Folks, did you know, by the way, to change the subject just a bit, that the average American has 97 points that they can add to their credit score, and they've got no earthly idea how to get a hold of them, Brian. Did you know that? That is a lot of points. I said this last time. I need to jump on this. That's a lot of points. Well, the folks at Scoremaster, and no, that is not Sweet Stan Lane's gimmick. It's Scoremaster. (laughs) The average ScoreMaster user raises their credit score 61 points in 20 days or less. 61 points. Now, let's just give you an example. For example, say your credit score was in the high 500s, mid 600s when you bought that new car. If you'd gone to ScoreMaster first and raised your credit score just the average 61 points that ScoreMaster customers get, you could have saved nine grand on your car loan. And... If you'd gone to ScoreMaster before applying for a home loan, got the 61 points, you could have saved almost a hundred grand, a hundred thousand dollars over the life of your loan. 
And I won't even talk about business loans. Holy mackerel. If you own a business, you know how essential great credit is. So you can go to ScoreMaster first and see how super boosting your business credit score can save you a fortune. ScoreMaster puts you in control of your finances, not those evil banks. Evil, heartless, greedy, avaricious corporations. Folks, you can enroll in minutes and see how many plus points ScoreMaster can add to your credit score. Go to scoremaster.com slash JCE, scoremaster.com slash JCE. And uh, once you've mentioned my name there, they'll give you a couple of extra points just because they like me so much. Anyway, check it all out. What are you doing this week? That's a great what, question. What do you have time to do this week with our shows and your shows and the children and the dog? You have no idea. There's yes, so I much. do. Yeah, you do. Yes, you actually, do. you actually are pretty busy, considering. But another action-packed week to escort you on your busy week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, and first I want to mention, coming very soon, Arcadian Vanguard t-shirts. So many of you have purchased Mothership t-shirts or 605 Super Podcast t-shirts. The first official Arcadian Vanguard t-shirt is coming in the next several weeks. Stay tuned for more information about how you can get a very, very comfortable t-shirt for yourself to support the greatest wrestling podcast. A very, very comfortable t-shirt. It's like, it's like sleeping in a puppy's belly. I assume, but I've never thought of it in that way. But we will see what we can find out. A few notes about the shows, Jim. This week on Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, John is talking all about Bruno San Martino. Some interesting what-ifs. If Bruno had not gotten injured, when would he have retired? When does Vince Jr. finally pull the title from Bruno if it gets to Vince Jr.? A lot of interesting what-ifs, what could have happened differently in the career of Bruno San Martino. Check it out today at McAdamPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Want to make mention of Ron Fuller Studcast at FullerPod.com, or search for Ron Fuller Studcast wherever you find your favorite podcast. We are in 1977, Knoxville, Tennessee, Southeastern Wrestling. Ron talks all about the Lumberjack match that drew 5,000 plus people. The Mongolian Stomper versus Ron Fuller. And also, things about how long does it take to become a star and how Southeastern Wrestling hid the stud's true identity. Get more information, fullerpod.com once again, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Eh? Well, thank you very much. Check out Opening Day Star Wars and, of course, Extra Innings for lots of wrestling and even some baseball talk with people like Kevin Sullivan, John Arezzi, and so much more available today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. See, those are the birds that are flying out of Riddle's ass. You've never played that one before, A. And B, when I brought up the idea of birds circling around his head because he was dizzy, you acted like you had no idea what I was talking about. I That's the sound. Were... That's I the knew sound. what you were talking about. <laughs> I didn't know it was on here. I found it afterwards. <laughs> I thought it was a ooh, but it was a... You've never, well, anyway. You've never played that on the air before. Well, all right. I thought you exhausted all of your buttons. I didn't realize there were more. There we go. I have waited. I've done that. <laughs> We've heard plenty of that. We've heard plenty of that. Yeah. Not enough of that. Not enough of that. Oh, there. How about this? Hey. Hey, shut up. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Riff Flair always found a fat boy to yell at in the crowd. Hey, shut up, shut up fat, fat boy! boy. <laughs> My shoes cost more than your house. You could live in these. <laughs> all right, before we get to all of the uh, 
WrestleMania festivities on our next program. We've got to talk about just the regular old Wednesday night programs, the last head-to-head Wednesday night between NXT and AEW. And I got to admit, it's going to be easy to do the NXT review. There was one match, a few people of interest, and a bunch of crap. So should we start with NXT? Well, we can't end with that based on what you just said. <laughs> although this, I've already blown the surprise. Although the high point of NXT was the best thing of Wednesday night. Well, it wasn't just the best thing of Wednesday night. How long has it been since we've seen anything that good? Months. Uh, anyway, um, this is for the, the Wednesday night culmination of the wars on April the 7th. Nita Strauss is great, by the way, as always. It's nice that she's a fan and comes and plays them, plays for them on the on the big shows. And they start this thing off with a gauntlet eliminator, a multiple man match. Oh joy, something different. And of course, they start with Pete Dunn against my favorite wrestler on NXT, Kushida. If they brought Little Tokyo back from the dead and got some gear for Kushida, then maybe I would watch them wrestle. But otherwise, I said, no, I'm not going to start off like this, right? Um, So, what, no, what, that was the first match. That wasn't the gauntlet eliminator. See, I've, I've, I've conflated my notes here. They just had a match. I didn't care. I didn't watch it. Then they had a gauntlet eliminator. Is that clear? I don't know. <laughs> Can you tell I don't care? Yeah, Dunn and Kushida. Then the gauntlet eliminator, they started out with with Swerve and Leon Ruffin, two medical school student skeletons fighting each other. Swerve isn't that skinny. Ruffin makes up for it. Um, it just <sighs> then then Bronson Reed was the next one in, and I started watching because I'd been fast forwarding through the show waiting to see something interesting, which is why I fucked up the first match. Uh, but Bronson Reed comes in, so I start watching. And here he is. He's a, a star in the making, and he's playing with children. And he German suplexed both of them at one point, and uh, poor Leon's going to get killed because they can throw him around, and he lets them, and he's going to get killed. And then here comes Cameron Grimes. He's got new music because now he's rich, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, of course, you first thing you do is go out and get new music. <laughs> first thing. <laughs> um some way or another it, it, it they did a distraction they got bronson reed down where swerve glommed him from behind while he was looking at cameron and then cameron moonsaulted him and you know that okay except that then cameron grimes immediately pays off swerve with actual cash that he brought in the fucking and pulls out of his it's they're going for funny and phony in the middle of this thing. It's supposed to be, I don't know. The manager is supposed to try to pay off the referee as a fucking little rib funny spot. Not, not in the middle of the match. And then when they did that spot, Reed disappeared for no good reason for forever. And so I started fast forwarding again, because now it's just back to the kids playing. And we'll talk about this, or we have talked about it, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, many times more, because they won't quit doing it. Now, especially uh, with the, their limited fans in the arena, or in, in WWE's case, no fans, people just leave the match when it's not time for them to be doing their spots. They just they roll out of, on the floor and hide behind the ring apron, and they disappear while the other people are performing. And then they come back for no good reason, except it's their spot now. They're not even having real, actual, full fucking matches. Just what you see on camera, apparently. Because why else would this guy take a moonsault and a drop kick and be gone for four minutes? The other guy fucking takes a bump off a ladder through a fucking table to the floor and doesn't stay down for a two count. Here comes Loomis. Um, Swerve beat on Ruffin during Loomis's entrance and killed that flattered four o'clock. So he hears the big music of the big entrance. He's coming and Swerve just jumps on Leon. 
Loomis goes by Bronson Reed and just gives him a bump on the stage. And so he's going to be out again for a while. So I'm fast forwarding again. And then finally it gets down to Loomis and Bronson Reed. So two grown men. So I'll watch this. They do a nice one and two, and then they start reversing each other. And nobody ever took a bump. Neither one of the two of them ever took a bump. The others just started interfering. So we got the big man and then they took it a big man fight. And then they took it away from us. Cause uh, why does, why do they think it's exciting when a, a two big guys get in there? And the first thing they do is start picking each other up and going for their finish and dropping down and foiling each other. But nobody ever actually gives a guy a bump. There was no payoff there. Then there's more people. Here comes old LA Knight. Who's Eli Drake, L.A. Knight. See, same number of syllables. And I like him. I worked with him in the NWA. He's a good guy, and he was on fire here, but he cut, he, he's known for his promo, so he starts talking to the ring with the microphone, and everything in the match comes to a halt just because a guy's talking on a microphone. Why didn't you give him a fucking promo before the fucking match? Once he got in the ring, and, and for some reason, Reed was still by the ramp, and, and fucking old Eli, Eli L.A. just kicks him in the head on the way by. Yeah, you piece of cra trash. Boom. <sighs> Why did Bronson Reed leave the ring area and go all the way over to the fucking ramp? So finally, well, it's because of the spot that he needed to do. Because now he jumps up behind L.A. Knight and interrupts the promo and tosses him into the ring. So he had to leave the ringside area and go all the way over to the entrance stage so that L.A. Knight could kick him in the head so that he could have a reason to toss him in the ring. And then they go to the break. And when they came back, the best part of the match, honestly, was L.A. Knight running wild. Shit was looking good. He was fucking hitting people with stuff. Boom, he had life. He had enthusiasm. His moves looked sharp. And he jackknifed uh, and pinned Loomis. And then immediately they've, they've has, half ass got me interested in somebody new. So Grimes and Bronson Reed immediately, heel and babyface, work together, glom LA Knight and beat him. And he's done. And then, just to make sure they buried him after he was the most exciting thing in the match. He rolls out on the floor and Loomis gets his hold on LA Knight on the floor and puts him out. Thanks for coming. The most impressive guy so far picked up the energy. New guy needs a push and Swerve is still in this, but LA Knight's out. So fuck it. I fast forwarded to the finish. Bronson Reed finally beat Swerve with a splash off the top rope and earned the right to take on Johnny same face. And I didn't watch that because that was on the cock the next night. But did Bronson, please tell me Bronson Reed defeated Johnny Sameface, this 350 pound brand new giant star they've got in the making, certainly kicked the shit out of the 160 pound middle schooler, didn't he? The winner, and still Johnny Sameface, Johnny Sameface. I'm I'm eating. I'm eating them. No, you don't have to eat it. That I'm doesn't eating, help I'm anything. I'm eating the paper. I'm eating the paper. All it's gonna do is hurt you. Why would you do I'm that? A fucking sheep. Fuck that shit. You get a fucking paper cut. Lead allergy or something. You're writing in pencil. Well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> right. No, it's 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 a fine point black marker with Cornet's collectibles on the side of it. Anyway, so. <laughs> After that, <laughs> here comes the match that I wanted to see. Uh, I threw that paper in my mouth. <laughs> uh, Recycle that. I'll try. I've still got. I've still got. I started to say I've still got paper in my mouth. Then no, what, what I was. This is the match I wanted to see. The next match, but it was on halfway through the program. I'm thinking this is not the main event for the NXT. UK Championship, Valter versus Tommaso Ciampa. Let me just spend a little time on this. 
for all the people who say I don't like anything. And then, of course, nobody will pay any attention to this anyway. But once again, it's not hard to see what professional wrestling is supposed to look like when there's actually once in a while still doing it. And these guys did it. This was the best professional wrestling match I have seen from any company in months and months and months. And honestly, going back to Walter, Walter and Elia, um, which was memorable also, but a completely different style of match here. That was more strong style. This was more guys working and working snug. But both these guys have great entrances. They have a presence. They look like stars. They're, the Champa's gear looks good. Valter's lack of gear really looks good because that he looks like that fucking square-jawed SS officer in a fucking Nazi war movie. They walk like they're serious. And Champa is in incredible shape. Uh, I mean, just, you, we've talked about some of the injuries he's had in his career, major neck surgery, major knee surgeries. Um, he's the dedication that he had. If, if Tommaso Ciampa was a serial killer, we'd all be in trouble because the determination that he has is fucking frightening to come back from injuries, to keep himself in shape, to do what he wants to do, whatever, but that you could have sold his look in any era and the same with Walter. Um, we talk, I've mentioned Hans Schmidt earlier. Walter is a 21st century update of Hans Schmidt in, in concept an evil foreign German menace, but he's, he works like a modern guy, but you know, they didn't work like that in 1953, but, it's the same concept and the same image. Um, and uh, again, Champa, you know, you, you could have put either one of these guys on Starcade 86 and they could have had this match in front of a Crockett crowd at that time period. And it was still torn the house down. I mean, can, can, cause I was sitting, when I went back and watched this again, after it was done, I watched the match again. Um, uh, which was good because there wasn't anything else on the show I wanted to see. Imagine them being in Florida, 1978, or the Omni in 1986, or in, in having this match, people would, it, would have still gotten over. And you can't say that about almost any other match. If you took most modern matches and you put them in front of those crowds in those environments at that time period, they would have booed the fucking thing out of the building. I mean, do you disagree? Not to whether the match is good for people to watch it now or not, but most it would have fit in. modern yeah. matches would be booed out of the building if they took place in the territories in the 80s, whereas this would have fit. I think this would have fit, yes. You're not going to say most modern matches would be booed. Because you're causing me to have to stop and think about all the modern matches. And, I mean, I'm sure there are modern matches that work, that would work this, in those times. This time being periods. one of them, yes, but yeah. as said most. Most. I mean, yeah. Put, and, put Luchasaurus out in, in the Charlotte Coliseum in 1986 and tell me people wouldn't be laughing at him. Yeah, I think they would be. Okay, all right. Anyway, I love the in-ring title introductions. Uh, that they do it makes it look like a big deal i'm not sure about the female announcer i'm not hearing finkel or bruce buffer or some stentorian authoritarian voice um i honestly from the time they got started with this it just felt different when when tomaso was ducking and evading the bigger guy i was kind of wincing along with it like oh shit he almost got him i boo um, the first big chop from Walter, he sold it like a gunshot and it fucking popped. They actually did a, an intelligent, different desk spot. Instead of just throwing one another through the desk, they put Walter's chop over by having him chop a fucking hole in the goddamn uh, thing that covers up the monitors or whatever, the top of the desk. Um, they had a great fight. 
there was a heel and a baby face. Everything was logical. It was a struggle. They never lost sight of a contest. It was obviously two serious men that, you know, if you were a guy, you think, well, I don't necessarily know I want to fuck with these guys. And if you were a woman, you were like, hmm, adult men. I don't know if too many women were watching Volter. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah, hey, I'll tell you what. I don't know. The heels, the heels didn't get as many women back in the day, but they got the more fun ones. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, they were uh, the heel women fans were a lot more fun. That's why the baby faces wore masks at the that's, hotel. Yeah, that's also why the baby faces were in a rotten mood most of the time. Uh, but anyway, um, They were making contact and they were working stiff, but it wasn't reckless or unprofessional at any point in time. Uh, Neither guy did anything that they wouldn't do if they were really who they are supposed to be, just because it would be a cool thing to do. Tommaso Ciampa didn't suddenly go, hey, I can moonsault off the top rope out on the floor and this guy's big enough to catch me. Because Tommaso Ciampa wouldn't do a fucking moonsault. They went back and forth in a believable way where you felt that the momentum was changing in a struggle instead of just guys trading the opportunity to do moves. It was well thought out, excellently executed. I watched the picture in picture because I didn't want to miss anything. You know what? I'm going to say that's my biggest complaint about this match. I didn't watch it on Peacock. I watched it on TV. The picture in picture looked awesome where he hit Walter, uh, Walter, excuse me, Yes. Whatever, 15 times in a row off the ropes, and he was yes. waiting for them to go down. That being in the picture in picture really pissed me off because if there was a crowd there, the crowd would have been going nuts. But I'm sure the fake fans were going really nuts. And I wish that would have been <laughs> full screen for that. But that that was that was the thing, is that and people are saying, well, now that sounds goofy. He hit him a million times with it. No. He kept running and hitting the ropes and clotheslining the big fucker. And Valter would sell, but he wouldn't go down. And he'd stagger and he'd register. And it just over and over again, he's drilling him, boom, boom, boom. And finally, he's coming off for the last one. And Valter hits one chop, boom. And fucking Champa takes the bump. And that's when he sits up and fires up. He didn't fire up after he got hit over the head with a baseball bat. He's pounding the fucking guy the guy gets one chop that levels him but he comes up and says no motherfucker it it, 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 tomaso had great facials Walter, what a worker what a beast he is with those hands um there was one point they made a mistake i will say i will just say this tomaso forgot something briefly and Walter went with that and Tommaso went with Walter going with that. And it was worked through so masterfully that I won't even say what it was because nobody else noticed it or I bet you they didn't notice it, but that was the only fucking thing I could find wrong with this thing. And then when Tommaso gave Walter his, his finish, I can't remember what he calls it, but Rico Constantino's old thing. Um, They both sold, it was off the top rope, which uh, obviously is a big deal, but they both sold it like fucking grim death. So it wasn't like just doing stupid moves off the top rope. Boom, they caught one, boom, and they sold it. And then um, uh, there was the the spot where Tommaso bridged with Valter on top of him, which was amazing. And then Valter stomps the bad neck. Two power bombs gets a two count, but then the big overhead suplex boom on on Tommaso's head and hits him with that big chop one two three. I think Valter for his gimmick is one of the best in ring workers that I've ever seen. Wow, ever. he doesn't do anything that he shouldn't fucking do, and everything looks good, and he's. He's got the way of laying hands on people that makes it violent instead of working without being dangerous. Anyway, I thought this was a masterpiece. I saved the DVR, and it was one of the best WWE matches of the modern era of the last few years of whatever the fuck it is they've been doing. 
What'd you think? I wish he was the main eventer in NXT, not just NXT UK. If he was on every week, I wish I he was the main eventer at WrestleMania. Yeah, well, I don't wish that Vince McMahon would get anywhere near him because that <laughs> will mess things up. All of a sudden, it will be something goofy. Like, you know, oh, you're, uh, you're German. Why don't we just say you're French and you're like Jerry Lewis? Like, it'll just be something that doesn't need to be done. Why don't you wear some Lederhosen? <laughs> yeah, it will be bad. But this was great. My biggest complaint, like I said, was the picture in picture. I didn't want there to be any picture in picture for this, but when it actually hit, shit was really hot. I mean, to the point where I watched the picture in picture. That's how good it was. Love this. It should have been on last because you couldn't follow it. Yeah. Well, and as a matter of fact, they didn't. It was Mendoza and Wild against MSK against the Grizzly Veterans. Uh, and then uh, and then the main event was Shirai and Gonzalez, and I wrote seriously, and that was it after that. I did you hear know. from a lot of people that Io Shirai versus Raquel Gonzalez was really good. I'm happy for him. They shouldn't have put it, they shouldn't have put it on after Volter and Tommaso. Good night, the party's over. Turn out the lights. You ain't following that. Anyway, and by the way, um, we'll go ahead and reveal this now since it's news uh, that everybody knows anyway, but just on this program without waiting. What was the ratings? They, uh, NXT finally tops them by about 100,000 fans, a combination of this being a, a, being a hot and well-advertised NXT program, even though it was shitty when you actually saw it, except for Volter and Tommaso. and the cumulative effect of AEW having a bunch of rotten programs in a row and people starting to fucking figure that out. So what they get? They got a six, 680 something to 780 something, wasn't it? Dynamite got 688, 0.28 in the key ratings demo. NXT, 768.22 in the key ratings demo. Okay, 80,000 people difference. And But have we noticed... That the winner always wins with the high sevens or low eights, and the loser always loses with the high sixes or low sevens or thereabouts. It's the same fucking people. How big of a bump do you think AEW is going to get without NXT against them? They're not going to pick up all the viewers. No. But how many, what, what kind of bump do you think they'll get? Well, and first of all, before anybody says, oh, now he's just knocking them, why wouldn't they get all the viewers? Well, Raw didn't get all the viewers when Nitro went away. Because that that's where a, about six or seven million wrestling fans went. They they said, well, the NWA, the Southern style, the real style is gone. We don't like the WWF, so we're just not going to do this anymore. And that's not subject to dispute because it's been proven because those people never came back. Uh, and I haven't heard of a catastrophe in 2001 that wiped six million people off the face of the United States. So I have to assume they just stopped watching that, those programs. Um, I think they'll get about a hundred, 150, 200, whatever that crossover audience was that keeps going back and forth. And the other people are just going to watch NXT on Tuesday nights and, and have a free night on Wednesday because the reason I guess the most sensible reason why nxt's audience skews older than aew's is what we were talking about earlier at least nxt the guys are trained they look like athletes and it's the closest thing to what pro wrestling looks like looked like for people who liked wrestling and for the younger audience who never saw wrestling at least done properly or seriously and think that you know everything's you know for shits and giggles that's what they want to see which is the exact thing that runs off the older wrestling fan they don't want to see shits and giggles the problem is the product getting the new fans the young fans it's not making any new ones it's the people that existed in this world that wanted to go out of their way to find hokey bullshit high school cheerleading wrestling and they already knew about it nobody else wants to see this shit because it's fucking stupid so here's where we are we got a small group of young fans watching one thing and they ain't getting any more and you've got the other company that's not real fucking 
exciting, but at least it kind of still looks like wrestling, so the older fans watch it, and they're going to die soon. So that's our growth industry for wrestling here. You want to you go to AEW? It's a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> well, Tony Khan would have to sign you first. <laughs> that's um, right. So over on the other channel, the inner circle pull up in sports cars, do an action movie pose and walk in. And I, I, I appreciate, I know they did. It's an update of the same thing. They got a, a plane in Charlotte at the airport for flair to come private plane for flair to come off of with women. And Magnum TA rode a motorcycle through the streets of Atlanta for the first primetime TBS special. But didn't this just seem more, posed and phony and egregious because they they didn't really pull up to the arena in those vehicles or arrive in town in those vehicles it was an obviously staged shot (laughs) yeah (laughs) where they drove in in separate cars and vehicles with jericho in front and then got out and posed so it it just do you see what i'm saying yeah i can pretty much guarantee whose idea that was well, yeah, but why not make it like this is how we really do, you know, fucking travel around instead of, oh, look at the cool shot that we set up for this movie we're going to make. Anyway, the first match was Adam Page and Max Caster, who sounds like a fucking character from your show of shows in the 50s. Um, the rapper is witty, but I hate the shit to begin with. Uh, but he is at least witty. However, what the, it, Page now, it, it's, Page is back to drinking beer instead of whiskey. So now he's not a sad drunk, he's just a fun-loving drunk? Is that what I'm led to believe? What happened to cowboy shit? Cowboy shit was when he was going to be the big baby face and the next champion, and then he became a sad, depressed drunk playing with children and and now I guess cowboy shit's been forgot. Yeah, pretty much. If Vince McMahon had wanted to push this guy, he'd be by now a fucking big star instead of a reformed drunk. Is all I've got to say. Um, so uh, Paige jump starts it when he super kicks the heels partner. So there's a jump start even on these cold matches, and then. Page immediately, did you see this part, gave Caster nine heads into the turnbuckle, and he didn't sell any of them. He just stomped his foot and held onto the top rope with both hands. It's like they're getting them out of the wrestling school in their first week. This is a guy that can do flips and flops and topes and have a coronas and all this athletic shit and he doesn't know how to have his head run into the turnbuckle. This is what... It, folks, imagine if you are if you were a fucking doctor and you went in the operating room and you saw the fucking heart surgeon trying to figure out how to open up the scalpel case. Would you have any confidence that he could fucking unclog that aorta? Caster went to drop behind on a suplex and fell on his ass. He can't throw a punch, so he throws those awkward forearms so rapidly that no, you can't sell them and none have any meaning to them. Uh, Page hit Caster with one of those sentons, which is basically uh, Caster's laying on his back and Page just jumps up in the air and lands flat of his back on Caster and almost missed him. And Caster was not moving. It's gotten contagious. Paige used to be the one of the best talents in the company, and now he's as sloppy as the rest of these fucking guys. And I guarantee you it's because nobody ever tells... I'm sure Max Caster is a wonderful guy, but nobody ever tells him or these other kids, your basics are shit, you're rushing everything, your psychology is sideways. They go, oh, wow, that move you did, or the dive, or the backsplash, or whatever. They put them over for how great they are, instead of saying, no, yo, obviously you went to a fucking screwy training program, or you didn't listen, 
or nobody gives a fuck anymore, but we do work on your basics. Don't hurt anybody before you start cartwheeling. Um, and then page in a match with a middle card guy, cold match. He's out, uh, out on the floor doing balancing spots on the guardrail with this guy and the corpse referee again, stupid and feckless. As a matter of fact, what's this guy's name? Rick Knox. I believe so. Feckless Knox. Sounds like a character in Blazing Saddles. Feckless Knox is his name from now on. He's watching the outside action. He's watching the heel partner interfere. He don't give a fuck. At one point, Caster got a chin lock on Paige's forehead and struggled to get that on right. Uh, they fought on the apron forever in front of the referee, took a goofy apron bump that they've all got to, and then, this was one of the best parts, as Paige is motionless on his knees on the apron of the ring, excrement says, Paige, headed up to the top. And then he got up and went to the top. <laughs> ah, while he's on the top, the heel partner distracts him. So he stared at the heel partner and Caster went to jump up on the ropes to superplex him off, but missed the fucking jump and had to jump up real quick. Second time. Nice save. But meanwhile, Paige just went with the superplex. He looked like an idiot. At this point, they say Max Caster is the number two contender for the title. Has he ever won a match? A singles match on television? Has he had a singles match on television? I don't... I think maybe, because I feel like lately we haven't seen him team up with his partner, but I don't know if he's been in six-mans or he's been singles. It all just happens, and I don't remember, and also we don't know what he does on YouTube. Well, nobody else does either. So then finally, Paige gets Caster up for his, his finish, the fucking thing where he... Like the wheelbarrow Alabama slam that Holly used to do, except he drops the guy on his head. And that there'd be a lot of negotiation going on to get me to take that anyway. But nevertheless, he's got the guy up on his shoulders, Caster. Has, he's got Caster up on his shoulders. The heel partner slides the boombox in in front of the referee for Caster to get while he's up on fucking Paige's back, but Paige gets it. And then the referee grabs it and takes it away from Adam Page. Like, well, you can't do it. It already should have been a disqualification. He just saw the fucking partner slide the thing in the ring. That's a disqualification. You know what they call it when they don't call a disqualification when an object or a person comes in the ring, but they don't touch somebody? You know what they call that, Brian? Lazy booking. So anyway, referee watches... Page gets the boombox and takes it away from him while the referee turns to put the fucking boombox out. The heel slides a chain to Caster, who wraps it around his fist and nails Page and gets a two count. They are letting the middle card guys have false finishes with foreign objects over one of your top baby faces in a cold match on television. I'm dying here. Just find people that have never done this before. They would do it better. Caster misses an awkward elbow drop off the top rope. The heel foils the buckshot lariat by Page right in front of the referee. The heel partner grabs his leg, but Page luckily backflips off the ring and mostly misses the heel partner and then hits the buckshot lariat on Max Caster. One, two, three. Page is now retrogressing. Except that he went to AAA and or AAA, maybe just AA, and got off the whiskey and back on the beer. What are your thoughts on this fucking abortion? My thoughts on the match are it was sloppy. I really didn't like it much. They really have done nothing significant with Adam Page since he lost to Kenny Omega. The Dark Order stuff isn't working for me. That's I have nothing else to add to this. Well. In the next segment, I want to read you Tony Schiavone's in-ring introduction. Can I, Brian? Would you let me do that? Please. Would you humor me? Yeah. Tony Schiavone's in the ring. Music starts playing, and Tony Schiavone says, Here in AEW, we have great tag teams, great teams all around. Let us introduce one of the great teams, some of the great athletes that we have here in AEW. Ladies and gentlemen, here's members of the Death Triangle. 
What the fuck was that? He couldn't even fit. It. He's one of the announcers of the show. And he couldn't even figure out whether they're a team or a group of teams or members of or who the fuck they are or why they're there. Here in AEW, we have great tag teams, great teams all around. Let us introduce one of the great teams, some of the great athletes that we have here in AEW. Ladies and gentlemen, here's members of the Death Triangle. And here comes Felix and Pack and Penthouse. They don't have the interpreter, who's the best one of the bunch with that smirky, slappable face. Um, so the Lucha Brothers were a team for a while. And then Felix and Pac were a team because Penthouse was the mortal enemy of Cody Rhodes because they had a big pull apart after Penthouse said he was going to hurt Cody's arm so he couldn't hold his baby daughter. And then they had a match and then they've never spoken of each other ever again. Um, but now the Lucha Brothers have been back to teaming, except now Pac is back. And then Tony tells... I guess Felix and Pac that they get a tag team title match next week because by then he had figured out that, well, this is two tag teams amongst the three guys. And, and, but then they didn't actually speak because by the time they got a chance to speak, here come the best friends pockets and chuckle fuck and Trent. And now Chris Statlander is a member of the best friends. So they, it's like the old Paul Jones army when Dusty would put all the fucking questionable talent in the same group so he could keep it isolated. Um, the heels responded in some kind of way to the things that the best friends said, a pocket slept, walked, slept, sleepwalked is the past tense instead of slept, walked, sleepwalked through some kind of line, the heels responded in some fashion. Pac had some emotion, but nobody really said anything or made any sense. It went forever, but nowhere at the same time. And then Trent finally said, the boys are back in town now with an alien. Cause after, as all you'll remember that Chris Statlander is an alien from outer space. So they spent about 10 minutes of national TV time with a bunch of underneath fucking guys that can't speak, that don't know how to speak, can't speak English, that have no discernible fucking identity whatsoever, plus an alien meandering at each other. What was the point of this? I have no idea. I'm clearly not excited about the return of best friends. <laughs> I think... So Death Triangle gets back together. When Pac returned, Tony Khan announced that something would happen that would change the face of wrestling. People forget about that tweet. Yeah. Several months back. I believe Pac and... And then, well, then when people called, it, called him on it, he said, it's the start of something that will change the face of wrestling. So Pac and Ray Phoenix get a title shot against the Bucks. But since that time that they won it... We've pretty much seen the Lucha Brothers and the Laredo Kid, not Pac and Ray Phoenix. And then Penta had, I guess, just a two-week feud with Cody, and that's over. So naturally, before their big tag team title match, out come the best friends that yelled the Death Triangle. What's, okay. What's that term? I, I, I believe it's going to be on a t-shirt soon. Lazy booking. Lazy booking. Okay, then we come to the re reunion, well, not the reunion, but, uh, but the the return of the inner circle and their big entrance. And after all the singing and all the, the bullshit and everything, Chris Jericho takes the microphone and he's the one that pitches to the break. These guys were attacked. They were bloodied they were beaten they were embarrassed they were thrown off high objects through things and they come back and after last week beating the bejesus out of the people that did it and really getting even and destroying the whole program before it ever got started because now they got their revenge including giving mjf a swirly in the toilet now when we hear them speak 
the first words out of Chris Jericho's mouth, the leader of this group that was so savagely attacked and, and turned upon and stabbed in the back. We're going to tell you what we've got to say right after this break. They had Jericho pitched the break. And then during the break, as has been revealed by more, they must think that, that everybody that comes in there is in a time warp and they all don't have a video camera in their pocket because every time they do something stupid off the air, Shaq getting out of the ambulance in front of the people, whatever the case, somebody records it. They're in the commercial break on TV and Jericho tells them in no uncertain terms to chant inner circle when they come back on the air. So it'll look like they're over. That was his exact words. It'll look like we're popular. And the only th the only thing worse than the heel begging for fucking crowd reaction is the baby face begging for crowd reaction. And, it, it, and there's ways you can get around that. And I mentioned this to you before we went on the air. People have seen that clip of the Greensboro fans, front row section D at the first clash of champions with the cornet sign and chanting cornet, cornet. And they did, they started that during the break too. And I told you what I did. I fucking standing there in the ring. I know it's during the commercial break. I'm a heel, but they went to all that trouble. So I covered the microphone up. I said, Hey, fucking save it for the air idiots. I'm still a heel and they saved it for the air. In this case, the baby face said, Hey, just make us sound like we're over. Instead of saying it's been so great. To, to, it's, it's so great to be back and hear you guys again. He can time it. They're supposed to be getting cues if it's a professional television production when they're going to go back on the air. I love hearing you people chanting for us right about five seconds before they go back on the air. Then he's being a baby face and he's fucking acknowledging the people, but he's not just saying, hey, work with us here. Chant for us on television. Make us look popular anyway. MJF is now is now my jerk off friend because Jericho said it about a dozen times. Um, I had mixed feelings about the the promo because at first the preposterous backstory about the whole reason that they were together with MJF and they they wanted to suck MJF's life force or something. When he had to explain why these groups were formed and why that that they tolerated MJF and, and trying to act like the whole thing really happened. That was rotten. That was rotten. Cause that was Tony Khan's backstory that they concocted or whatever. It was a rotten backstory, but it got good when he just started in on MJF and started cutting a fucking, a, a, a promo by heel. It's just turned baby face on another heel after having to listen to the children in the previous segment. This was a great promo. As I said, a little pandery baby face, but Chris is a good talker and he delivered it well. Good stuff. However, then remember, we've always said in wrestling, sometimes you got a match that needs a stadium. Sometimes you got a stadium that needs a match. Well, they've been dying to do this fucking war games match that they got fucked out of with the pandemic. And come hell or high water, whether it fits or not, or whether it's time for it or not, or whether they can make a penny off it or not, they're going to have that goddamn match. The very first match announced between any of the members of this faction rivalry is now the ultimate blow-off match, blood and guts, their version of war games, in a cage, five against five, on free television in four weeks, May the 5th. The first match. They're starting by coming, and 30 minutes later, they're going to finish by kissing. Your thoughts? At times, I thought the promo was good. At other times, way too, what'd you put it, pandering baby Pand face. Pandery? Pandery? I mean, basically begging people to chant what he wants them to chant, which comes across as obvious. But my jerk-off friend... It was humorous the first time, and then he kept doing it over and over and over. 
It's like it's like shit and son of a bitch. When you tell them that they can say that, then everybody's going to say it as many times as you'll let them. We'll talk about what they did later in the show, later in this show. But so far, after months of silly buildup and silly segments, MJF joined the inner circle. Within, I don't know, a couple months of that, he apparently tried to steal the inner circle, but it was a swerve. He had been putting together his own faction at the same time, and at some point he paid off the lighting guy, who shut off all the lights in that outdoor arena to get his faction into the ring. They destroyed Jericho. You know what? The whole angle would have been killed if it was still daylight savings time. It had been daylight outside. It would have fucked everything. The whole angle has been ridiculous. So they destroy Chris Jericho, beat up the inner circle, and then do a promo, and then have one match as a six-man team. And then Jericho and his crew, who now are angry enough that they're all wearing black, hide out in the bathroom of their former dressing room, which apparently they still have the key for, although not anymore. And they wait and they attack and destroy the pinnacle who just got together, including giving MJF a swirly. And then here they do an interview. I thought Jericho ran down all of them too much, quite frankly. Well, because it was a lot of truth to it. But it's also going to a War Games match, not even on the pay-per-view, on free (laughs) TV. They're doing this War Games match. They're going to do another pay-per-view in three months. They couldn't figure out 90 days with 10 guys of how to keep it interesting. They couldn't figure out three weeks of keeping them apart. They couldn't figure out how to keep this thing going without Jericho and his crew, who are clearly the baby faces here, getting their revenge. They got their revenge. Now they want more. This is so poorly done. Anyone who says Tony Khan's a good booker, anyone who says Chris Jericho has good ideas, you are a fucking idiot. This is so poorly done. And, and besides that, well, they'll find out when the baby face gets even and then wants more and gets more, then the people start getting sympathetic toward the fucking heel. And then you, you're completely fucking everything up. But anyway, they'll figure that out. Um, Here's something unusual that happened. An interview in the back happened where the interviewee actually got to speak a few words. It was Christian Cage. What's the girl interviewer's name? Dasha. Dasha. She's great. Uh, well. She's great. She, apparently she had to save this. I don't know what they did, but Christian was in the back. He got to speak. He wasn't being natural. He was trying to be dramatic. He spoke well, but not realistically people don't talk like that i you know i he's a well-spoken guy i don't know why they gave him all the flowery shit so whatever the fuck taz comes in pitches the offer to christian cage to join team taz and tells him to sleep on it i don't know why it would take that long to say i don't want to join a group that's constantly fighting amongst themselves and gets run off by senior citizens with uh fucking black baseball bats but anyway Whatever was said, Taz walks off, and boom, they slap a, a a graphic up on the screen. They slide a graphic in, and there was an audio edit where the Dasha, the girl interviewer, as I wrote, um, said made an awkward statement trying to close it up, but it was like there was going to be another question to Christian, and then suddenly the graphic comes up and she's pitching to a match out of nowhere and there's an audio edit. So they cut off the last part of that because apparently it was rotten and they didn't want to air it. And if they aired the other part of it, I'd hate to think what that looked like. Um, then, of course, they have the Godzilla versus King Kong match because they got a sponsorship from the movie. And who fits... The Godzilla, pro- it was not as exciting as when me and Michael Hayes did promos for him on Grandpa Munster's Super Scary Saturday on TBS back in 87, I'll tell you that. But Godzilla's team, of course, Jungle Boy and Dino Douche, at least there was no dwarf dong sucker to stink the joint out. He was nowhere to be seen, and that's a good thing. Against the team of Bear Country, where did they get Bear Boulder and Bear Bronson? 
I don't know. I'm surprised their manager wasn't Bronson Pinchot. Uh, <laughs> these guys, they I'm sorry. The what? What's the matter? Yeah. Bronson Pinchot. Really? Bronson Pinchot. Oh, oh, you're so ridiculous. You know, he's been in the news recently. Really? What did he do? He lost like 80 pounds or something. I didn't know he was fat to begin with. Apparently, he had gained a lot of weight in the last several years and used the pandemic to trim down. And he's been telling stories from his life about working with Tom Cruise and Eddie Murphy and various others. I remember him as being a, a very slight build fellow. I didn't know he got fat. Anyway, he needs to uh, then give Bear Boulder and Bear Bronson some diet tips. They, These guys, there wasn't anything wrong with them. They weren't doing flips and gymnastics, but they look like the top heel team in every independent promotion in Kansas. Just guys. Just guys. No tan, no uh, muscular definition, no ridiculous amount of size to make up for the lack of muscular definition, no look, no introduction, no promo. We don't know what the fuck. They're just here. They're upholding King Kong. The fuck? Anyway, um, the big bear country guy is as tall as Dino Douche. So all he did was make Dino Douche look smaller. Uh, within the first minute, Jungle Boy had done three dives out of the ring in a row, and then Dino did one. It just hot garbage from the start of this thing. Just an outlaw wrestling match. Uh, at one point, Bear Country caught Jungle Boy coming off the top rope and had him up like for a power bomb. And I can't even tell you what this spot was supposed to be. But Jungle Boy's up for a power bomb sitting on Bear Country's fucking shoulders backwards in the power bomb position, and Dino Douche comes off the top with a cross body to Jungle Boy's back and just hit him and did the George of the Jungle thing where he just slid straight down him to a heap. <laughs> and then Bear Country just turned around and dropped Jungle Boy. I think he um, was trying to catch both of them, which is crazy. Well, it look no, he what because there was no way he could have. You would have had to have been insane. Now that I'm saying this out loud, maybe they were trying to. You would have had to be insane, <laughs> yeah, to think that you could have caught Dino Douche in that position. It was more like that Dino Douche was going to cross body Jungle Boy, and Jungle Boy would end up in a Thez press on on the Bear Country guy on on the ground, but it didn't work. Because Dino's a klutz, and he can, and he wasn't coming at the right angle to even do that, and so he fell in a heap of douche at the guy's feet. And by the way, out of all the guys on this episode, even the young bucks, Luchasaurus is clearly the biggest offender with the leg slaps. Oh yeah, he oh, can't yeah. Well, stop. I, well, besides that, he you can plainly see it, and he's you know it's just it's the worst. Yeah, but they went to a break after the heap of douche. But when they came back to, from the break, you know, hey, that could be a shirt, too. There's a heap and help a douche for you. Uh, they got heat on Jungle Boy and gave the hot tag to Dino Douche. And go back, anybody that still has this on your DVR or whatever you watch. Dino Douche gets the hot tag. And his very second, he clotheslined, I think, the first guy. And the second move that he did on the fucking comeback, he tried to just, with his right foot, just throw a pump kick up on one of the heels. And he went right past him. He missed the guy who was standing in front of him with a fucking kick. He just went right like a foot past him on the side of him. And I'm telling this guy is big enough and strong enough and awkward enough. He's going to hurt somebody. At some point, even if just by falling on him, he's going to hurt somebody. So then they did something where Dino had covered one of the heels, but the other heel got Jungle Boy up, and it looked like he tried to power slam on top of the pile, and and it almost just it looked like it could have injured anybody involved in that. He just fell on him. And while they're doing this, the announcers are doing a ticket plug. Excrement's reading a hard sell on the ticket on sale. I, I can't even describe the mess of a finish that they did. And finally, the Godzilla team goes over and JR brought out, well, uh, parts of it were bowling shoe ugly.
Yeah, really sloppy. Really not good. At least Marco's stunt wasn't there. That was a pleasant surprise. It, it made it something better. But So then we go to QT Marshall and his group in, his, in the Nightmare Factory. Which, how do they now, since the Nightmare Factory, we've established QT, by his own words, was working for Cody, and Cody apparently started the Nightmare Factory. How do these guys, how could, didn't Cody have the locks changed? How are they still getting in? But anyway, because it's QT's wrestling school, and this is all a work. But suddenly now, QT is a full-fledged heel verbally ripping Cody apart, reading lines that have been written to put his group over, but he's a full-fledged heel now. When he was, up until three weeks ago, he was polite and fucking nice and used his left and right turn indicator. Um, Of the group, this Anthony Agogo, I told you his name was Agogo. You, you didn't did. believe me. No, you did. You, you did say it. He's got some personality. He's got an athletic background. He might be something. It might have to be in some other promotion because he's going to learn nothing and nobody's going get to get him over here in this fucking mess, but he's got the tools. One of the other guys threw paint at the Nightmare Factory logo on the wall and missed all the writing. Just blotched up the fucking black background. So now they're they're mad at Cody. Yeah, and the other guy, I mean, it was too inside, too. QT, whatever the other guy's name was, Bob Lobla, whatever. He said, he's not just some girl's boyfriend. How would anyone out there know that? Apparently, he was <laughs> Bailey's boyfriend, and they broke up recently. Oh, yeah, that's right. I heard that. No one well, knows that. It means nothing to anybody. But to the 150 or 200,000 people who are so dedicated to this company that they will buy the pay-per-views, they have no lives and they will research this endlessly. These uninteresting people doing this phony shit, because I mentioned earlier, women don't have a problem getting laid. That's why they have no time for foolishness and they don't have a lot of spare time because people are interested in them. But these guys that like this kind of wrestling and wrestlers, since the only fucking date they ever have is with the four sisters on Thumb Street, they got plenty of fucking free time to research all this. So anyway. Next, Sting wandered out in the snow. And he didn't speak. Tony tried to let him speak, but guess who came out again? Jake the Snake Roberts who interrupted and started rambling and this is starting to get concerning also because you remember when the one thing that you could say about jake the snake roberts was verbally no matter what the situation he could command your attention make some points and do them in a very sinister way yeah okay what did he say here i'm not exactly don't sure he was mad at sting I'm not exactly sure if it was for the same reasons that Archer apparently was mad at Sting. <laughs> Archer told Jake to stop so he yeah, could talk. Yeah, Archer came out and said son of a bitch on purpose because somebody told him he could, grabbed the microphone away from Jake and, and like he was hot at Jake and then started complaining about how he was booked. Like Sting has anything to do with that. In theory, his manager Jake might, except that he's not mad at Jake for the way he's being booked. He's mad at AEW. Ah. And Sting agrees with him. Apparently, he's complaining about how he's booked, and Sting sympathizes with him. Yes. And says he should do something about it. Yeah, he ought to do something about it. Jake, tell him how to do this shit. <laughs> what? He actually said, Jake, tell him how to do this stuff. It, it, the visual of Lance Archer in Sting's face also did no favors for Sting. It looked like an obnoxious biker telling off a fucking retiree because the retiree got mad at the biker for pi pi parking his motorcycle in the guy's fucking driveway of his condo somewhere in a retirement village in Florida. It was... In it, face paint. In face paint. And, you know, yeah, Sting basically said some shit, and all I got out of it was he thinks Lance Archer's a main event guy, too. 
They talked for five minutes with 30 seconds worth of topic, and then everybody just walked off. He basically explained the booking problems. He said, you showed up, you got a match, and you disappeared. Yeah. And, and then, then you, you got another push and you disappear. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's happened, Sting. Also, they had, without any mention, apparently another new group, or dare I say faction, Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page watching from the rafters. Well, are they? Uh, was that just the place that they happened to sit because they weren't on the show and they wanted to stay out of the way, or are they together? They wouldn't have been shown on camera without any mention of it if they were just together, I think. Yeah. I don't think it's a coincidence. Well, maybe they'll feud with Sting and Lance Archer, managed by Reluctant Jake. Old Ethan is like our little boy Pip there. He needs a a, a big brute with him to make him not look like a fucking high school child. Uh, Anyway, um... As I, and as I mentioned, everybody, have you noticed on these promos, a lot of times the interview segments, there's no, and this is another thing that a lot of these guys that have been to the WWF should have learned the most important line in a live promo, especially in a live confrontation between two opposing factions or uh, people is the go home line. And regardless of what else you do and whatever business you go into for yourself in the course of it, the go home line is because that makes the point. That's the cue for the music. That's the place you can get out gracefully instead of it being awkward and everybody just stopping fucking whatever they're doing and it's over. And that's what happened here. Everybody just walked off because it was over. Sting has not had, maybe he's had one. I was going to say he has not had any promos where he talks without someone just coming out. And I mean, it's a problem show wide. It's every promo. You mentioned before, well, at least Christian Cage got to say a few things. Yeah, Yeah, then Taz showed up. Death Triangle start talking. Best friends show up with an alien. Everyone's promo gets interrupted throughout the show every week. I can disprove that theory. Okay. Because the next promo was Team Taz in the back, and it was so short. It was so short. (laughs) They basically reiterated the same thing they've been saying for the past two or three weeks that they everything's fine and there's no trouble but this time they didn't get in an argument taz just told ricky starks not to instigate don't instigate don't instigate 30 seconds that was it boom and now we get to redo taz and darby remember taz wanted to manage darby and help darby and darby said no and that started the whole darby allen team taz feud same thing now with christian He wants to manage him. Christian will say no. And there we get Christian versus Team Taz. And here's the thing. Do the baby face turns the manager down once and everybody prospers from it. You've got a program. You've got an angle. You've got a personal issue. If everybody starts turning that manager down, (laughs) it's a fucking lousy manager. Remember they were going to do, remember he had big plans for the FTW title? What? Oh, no, that, I remember that. Yeah, they bought, that. didn't Tony Khan buy something, the rights to it or the oh, I don't know. belt or they made some deal. Yeah, it's going to be officially introduced here. Taz had it and they convinced Taz to bring it. I don't know if Tony bought it, but it was put on cage and it was going to be, they had big plans for the FTW title. That was a year ago. <laughs> that was at least a year ago. Uh, speaking of the titles, the TV champion, the face of the network, boy, <laughs> paging plastic surgeons everywhere, Darby Allen with Sting against J.D. Drake. Because a lot of people are going, who? And this he has one- his own faction. Yeah, he's got two guys outside the ring with him. But this was at the top of the hour, Darby Allen against J.D. Drake at 9 p.m. Eastern. Even if you're going to have it, don't have it here. I don't know. I mean, maybe they don't teach this in television anymore, but this is another thing that I learned specifically from Vince McMahon. At the top of the hour in the days when Raw was a, a juggernaut in the ratings, whether it's the top of whatever hour, 
whatever time zone you were in, the top of the hour in the t- in the middle of the two hour show, you had a main event guy or a main event issue headed to the ring, going on whatever the fuck, the Steve Austins, the Flares, the Takers, the Rocks, the whatever the fucks, the heavy hitters, because when people are flipping around at the top of the hour, if you if you tune in and see Stone Cold Steve Austin, you might give it a minute and get hooked. If you tune in and see J.D. Drake, I mean, unless he's got warrants out for him, there's nobody else that's really concerned with finding out where J.D. Drake is. But this was at the top of the hour. He looks like Mantar lost 80 pounds. So, and then it's con- it's contagious. Remember, Paige was sloppy. Darby Allen throws one of his drop kicks through the ropes. The guy's on the floor and coming back up on the apron and, and Darby throws a drop kick through the ropes three feet over the top of the guy's head and then realized that he'd completely missed him and then fucking ran and hit a dive out through that was had extra oomph behind it and almost killed both of them falling on their fucking heads. And this counting entrances got 12 minutes of national television time at the top of the hour before Darby Allen won the thing. And then there was an afterbirth. The Butcher and the Baker and fucking Matt Hardy and the Bunny come out and attack Darby Allen. But now Sting is supposed to do something. Well, he's got his bat and it looks like he's going to do something. Then here comes the door, the dork order. And there's running around and idiots with masks and pale, fishy (laughs) white physiques are running around with this fucking goofy looking bunch of, and then Ty Conti jumps the bunny and threw a barrage of fake punches at her. And while that's going on and all this other shit's taking place, they just pitch out. We go to a package of the six man main event. And while all this is going on, I thought the ADD drugs were supposed to make you focus on shit. It, is that not the deal? Is that uh, attention deficit disorder means that you have a deficit of attention. That means you can't focus. And that's a disorder. And if there's medicine to counteract that, would that not make you be able to focus and pay attention to shit? Then who is, that can't be the drugs they accuse him of being on that we have no proof whatsoever of. Just a lot of people saying it. But it can't be that kind of drugs because that would make him focus and pay attention and the shit would make sense and it wouldn't be all over the place. There is zero focus show wide and there is zero focus from segment to segment or from week to week. There's no focus in AEW right now. We do not have any proof drugs are involved. And you and you made me laugh before because it's true. They all just come out and everyone's running around like an idiot. They're just running. They're just running. Bunch of goofy looking fucking idiots. <laughs> out there what the fuck is going on uh all right well speaking of which that's a question we're going to ask here in a minute officer barb brady's in the back with chris jericho and chris jericho gets in two words before he is blindsided by mjf and the pinnacle ftr sean spears wardlow was tully around i didn't see tully i thought i saw him but now maybe i don't know you're making me question he was, he was he was smart enough not to be center of attention in all this so they jump uh jericho and they beat him into the arena and into the ring and everybody where's the inner circle where's the rest of the inner circle they spike pile drive jericho and then suddenly there is a shot of the outside of the inner circle's locker room and an axe coming through it. Oh, that they've nailed the door shut. <sighs> if they knew enough to get a cameraman to go to the inner circle's locker room, they just discovered that they, these people weren't beating and pounding and banging on this door for a while. That, 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 Remember when they locked the the guys in the locker room in, in Cleveland on the Clash of Champions and, and put an end to the relationship between WCW and Baba because Baba was so offended that people would 
do something that fake uh, with his wrestlers involved? Uh, so anyway, um, so they break out through the locker room door, but meanwhile, in the ring, Wardlow is ready to power bomb Chris Jericho over the top rope through a table because that's what you do whenever you want to injure a, a hated enemy. You don't just fucking hit him with a bat. You just you power bomb him over the top rope through a table. But music hits, and everybody just stops. It's like you can see 50 feet around the ring. Nobody can stop you. You can powerbomb this motherfucker if you want to, but the music is playing, so they stop, and out comes Mike Tyson, who they already had said was there in the building and going to be on the show. They spoiled that surprise because TNT doesn't want any more surprises kayfabing themselves, but then they didn't even false book a reason for him to be there and then him come out to do this. They just said, yeah, Mike Tyson's here, and well, here's the spot he came out at. And clearly this was not planned, so it's lucky that something happened that they needed Mike Tyson out there or he wouldn't have been on the show because he wasn't written in anywhere else. Did you notice that? So they would have false advertised by not having Mike Tyson on the show if accidentally MJF and the Pinnacle hadn't attacked Jericho. Anyway, Mike Tyson comes out and every heel in that fucking ring freezes. Mike Tyson was the baddest man on the planet at one point. Mike Tyson is now close to 60 years old and there's five men in the ring and they're all bigger than Mike Tyson. But they turn around and fucking start to run. And the only one left is poor old Spears. And Tyson gets a hold of Spears. And I'm sure Spears was not upset about this because it was better than the alternative for him. But Spears threw, or Tyson threw dozens of absolutely fake punches at Sean Spears. Not even the one that every time a boxer has been involved in wrestling since day one as a referee or a second or whatever, that's the closing spot. One punch knocks the fucking heel out. No. This one, he fucking took Spears into the corner and fucking hit him with 26 real short shots that were very fast and didn't land anywhere. I'm sure Spears didn't mind. After all, he's the guy who took the stunner. Said. He's the yeah. guy who took the stunner from Tony Khan. Well, I'm I'm sure he didn't mind not getting hit for real by Mike Tyson, but it was as phony as a football bat. Um, and then the inner circle comes in, and the pinnacle leaves, and Tyson and Jericho shake hands. And as I mentioned earlier in the program, Vince McMahon won the wrestling war, got the biggest box office attraction of modern times over in one night with the right timing and usage of Mike Tyson. And they just paid a past his prime celebrity to come out and expose the business in a phony looking way. What do you say to Mike Tyson in a three piece suit? Will the defendant please rise? Oh, come on. <laughs> Where did that come from? I just, I just thought of Tyson. Anyway, I've, it, Conor McGregor would have worked in that spot. That's why if, if McGregor ever does wrestling, the WWF will get him because they spend money for things that they need that can make a, a difference and they have timing. But not Mike Tyson in 2021. Go ahead. Well, a few thoughts here. One, you brought up Wardlow powerbombing Jericho earlier. Wardlow went from wearing a suit and looking like a badass. <laughs> now he's dressed like the DJ from D-Light. Like, what is he wearing? And he's out there. He doesn't look tough in that outfit, even though he is. The other thing is, let's play, uh, I don't know if it's devil's advocate, or let's just be hypothetical here for a moment. If everything with Pinnacle and the Inner Circle happened, and we didn't have the Inner Circle attack Pinnacle, flush MJF's head down the toilet, throw him through a soda machine, and we didn't have the promo earlier in the show with Chris Jericho running down Pinnacle in, at times, a comical way, but really just an all-around, he just ran everyone down yeah. too much, I thought. If you didn't have those two angles, and you went from MJF turns, turns on the inner circle, 
Inner Circle gets destroyed. Jericho gets destroyed. Pinnacle has several weeks on TV doing promos and matches. The first time you see Jericho since then, he immediately gets attacked by them, brought out there. They're kicking his ass. Mike Tyson saves him. We can go over the semantics of all the things that were done wrong in and of itself. But if you went from the first time Jericho gets hurt and the first time you see him again is here where he's getting beat up again by the heels and Mike no. Tyson makes the save. No. Then it would have no. made more sense. No, well, but it, more, but not good. When they got beat up, they should have disappeared. And you leave a television show, as you said, for three or four weeks to the new heel group, to the new Motormouth MJF. The tag team FTR gets a win on every show. MJF gets a win on every show. Spears gets some kind of heat by being involved in some kind of way and helping the other ones cheat. Wardlow does his bodyguard thing. Nobody can fucking stop him. And then instead of the entire inner circle coming back and just beating up the group en masse when they do come back, there's where you could have had some fun with it. If you didn't do goofy shit in every other segment, there's where one member of Pinnacle if they hadn't had 27 kidnappings already, Pinnacle would be sitting there all of a sudden turn around and go, Wait, where's, where's so-and-so? I didn't see him. And that's when he comes staggered in with his fucking clothes ripped off and his goddamn face bleeding or whatever. And goddamn, I got pulled off the road. I don't know who the fuck. And there's guerrilla warfare going on where Pinnacle keeps finding their shit fucked up but they don't see it happen or somebody gets fucking way late or blindsided or whatever, and you milk this, and they know who's behind it, but they can't find them. And MJF never gets touched. This is just out of the top of my, off the top of my head or out of my ass, but you figure out a way to keep it going until finally the fucking inner circle comes back and they get in a big pull-apart five-way brawl. But inner circle has been the ones that's been picking at and sabotaging pinnacle for a few weeks. And then they get in a five way brawl where everybody gets beat up and there's all kinds of chaos and authorities are called and ambulances are pulled in and whatever, but no faction clearly gets the upper hand. And then that calls for a 10 man tag match, maybe on free TV. And then the goddamn finish you do out of that, that might call for a, some type of gimmick match a few weeks down the road, and then that would call for the blood and guts payoff on pay-per-view. But you don't... The, the, I agree with you. It could all when be When the good better. guys just come back and just fucking beat up the heels, well, you, then you've just answered your question. Asked and answered. I completely agree with you. This whole thing could have been booked better and could still be booked better. My only point was, if they took out the return of the Inner Circle and the promo from earlier this episode, and when right from Jericho gets beat up to the Mike Tyson angle, it would have been better. It would have. Yeah, just if you had just taken out the inner circle getting their revenge and they're doing a promo about how stupid all those other guys are. <sighs> well, you made me watch a match that my first thought would have been to skip through, and I still loathe you for it. I watched the bunny wrestle Ty Conti. And the bunny had the butcher and the baker and Matt Hardy with her. And Ty Conti had still with the sun on national television. It, it, it just, uh, the, the whole dork order thing's ridiculous, but still the child on TV in it's, it's supposed to be a, a, what is supposed to be a professional endeavor. and. Anyway, uh, Ty Conti looks like she's wearing a wig for some reason. It doesn't look like real hair. Uh, they started off fighting as to quote Bret Hart about his fight with Shawn Michaels in the bathroom in Hartford. They started off like two whores on Bourbon Street. Uh, the girls are now giving each other suplexes and drop kicks on the floor. Now, the girls can do it. So ne next we'll have the eight-year-old children doing suplexes on the floor. They went through a break on this, which was a good way to lose even more viewers, which apparently they did, judging by the ratings. Um, 
Ty Conti hit her finish and got a two count and looked horrified. I meant like scared to death, like just mortified. And then everybody on the floor suddenly got in a fight and they've got the people in the mast running around and I don't know where the kid was and <laughs> Matt Hardy's, you know, is he making his money this year or this quarter or whatever? I don't know what's going on with all of this. Bunny used a kendo stick on Ty Conti and then Ty superplexed and DDT'd the bunny and got a three count. Thank God. What a mess. Uh, and uh, Bunny is very attractive. <laughs> and they ought to do something with her where she could stand there and be attractive. I you you mentioned that a lot of people were enamored of her her tongue stud. She has one of those tongue studs. I I'm telling they're overrated. I don't know what it feels like to have one, but I know what it feels like to know people that have them, and I wasn't a fan. <laughs> Can cause bruising. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So our main event, what's the matter with you? Bruising, you say? Bruising. Not to be confused with bruiser, as in Dick the. But Maybe technically. Could be confused with yeah. Dick the bruising. <laughs> All right. So the main event of this program was Twinkle Toes, Gallows and Anderson against the CEO of Moxley Plumbing and his sidekicks, the Cucamonga Kids. I was good. Didn't they have this last week? Or didn't I ask that last week? Last week, you, in fact, asked the exact same question. What I believe is confusing you is it was three weeks ago, you had the Young Bucks and their pal Brandon Cutler versus the Lucha Brothers and the Laredo Kid and then last week, it was the Lucha Brothers and the Laredo Kid versus Omega and the Good Brothers. And then this week, it's the Good Brothers and Omega versus the Bucks and Moxley. Yeah, all right. Um, the Cucamonga Kids are still upset because they've lost Harpo Finger Bang's fucking friendship. Uh, Moxley comes in from the parking lot again. Um, why did the Bucks... Spend so much time here a few months ago trying to turn heel and then just they just end up being baby faces still again or continuously. But they were obnoxious, smart ass baby faces for a while. Did they ever actually work heel? Nothing I mean, has ever been explained. The thing. Nothing has ever been explained about why they were so conflicted and they were super kicking Tony and Marvez and causing all yeah, these but, problems and then Things went back to normal, and then Don Callis has been abusing him, and then it leads to this, and so much bad acting from, uh, what, what's his name, Mike, not Mike, Matt Buck or whatever his name, <laughs> I forget his name right now. So Matt this. Cucamonga. Matt Cucamonga. What? And then the other one is like the stoner who's never smoked. I can't even explain what's going on in that head. And the thing, I mean, spoiler alert, about to the Bucks are about to turn heel in this match, but the problem is they just they turned heel six months ago. They were super kicking the TV announcers and being smart asses, and then suddenly somebody savages their father and bloodies their father. So they're they're baby faces trying to get even, but then who was it that beat up their father? And Jericho bloody, and MJF. Oh gosh! Well, and then they, now that they, ended. <laughs> anyway, uh, Harpo and Pie Face started out, and they locked up and danced around like two old wash women, like they'd never locked up before. Uh, then, old Balding Cucamonga, he got in with Harpo, and they got so mixed up on a spot, they got a step ahead of themselves and got off track and couldn't get back on, and Harpo grabbed a headlock with his right arm. They were so far afield. He actually, he grabbed the headlock with his right arm. And they, they just fumbled through that. They did some flawless gymnastics. They just can't fight or wrestle or appear tough or serious, but they can do gymnastics all day long. Uh, all three baby faces did a dive at the same time and everything came to a halt so they could go to the break. 
Uh, when they came back, they gave Moxley a tag. He made a big comeback. Then they stopped him. And they got some heat on him. He sells a little bit better for Gallows and Anderson because they're big enough to make him, I think, is the only reason. Uh, another cold tag to Balding Cucamonga. And he did more stuff. And then they did some more cold tags. And then Harpo and Pieface went into a long exchange and everybody else disappeared. Like I was talking about earlier, you could see Moxley actually kneeling on, kneeling on the floor behind the apron, looking up over it, waiting for his turn to come in. While the... It, it, now matches are like concerts. They have a drum solo so the other guys can go take a piss. Midnight Express did a few hour broadways. I would have liked to have had a goddamn drum solo so I could have run back in the fucking bathroom and taken a piss. Um... And then suddenly uh, your friend Matt, Matt Cucamonga, will not super kick Harpo. He, they're still friends. And then Harpo slaps the shit out of him several times, so Pieface takes him down and hits him with a thousand fake punches in the vicinity of his elbow. This was, this was worse than the girls. Matt Jackson throws punches worse than a girl because it, it, it's conclusive evidence. Now the fake punches, the girl threw, still look better than the fake punches that this idiot threw. Then everybody hit a finish on everybody. And after each one of them, they just roll out and make room for the next ones to come in and do their stunt. Everybody did the shit, the same shit they do in every match. And then suddenly pie face again, got worried that Harpo was, was hurt. Maybe there's something going on between them two. You think old Matt Jackson's wife should be worried? I don't think um, so, no. So the Bucks couldn't bring themselves, couldn't bring themselves, I believe was a quote from one of the announcers, to finish off Harpo. But Moxley, being a grown adult man, supposedly, is pissed about that because it's supposed to be a fight they're in instead of goddamn grade school. Guess what? You picked the wrong company to fucking abscond to, Moxley. You don't want to be in grade school. So Moxley's pissed, so he jumps in and DDTs Harpo twice, while Gallows and Anderson are absolutely nowhere to be seen because this isn't their part. So this giant 300-pound Gallows has been neutralized somewhere and is not even a part of this. And then the Bucks turn around and superkick Moxley because they're mad that he DDT'd their friend Harpo that they've been fighting with and has just been slapping him in the face. Because this happens at every grade school in America. So then immediately, within seven seconds, no, five seconds, Kingston is running out the entranceway. Eddie Kingston, who literally had to be watching the monitor, waiting for a spot that he was needed in, in people's minds as a shoot. Not just waiting for his spot, but he had to be literally on the other side of the entrance because within five seconds after his own partners, Moxley's own partners, super kick him, here comes Kingston to save the day. And Gallows and Anderson reappear and glom him and kill him and give him a big bump on the stage that'll probably cause him to have permanent fucking injuries years later for no reason because nobody's going to remember it fucking tomorrow. And then it, it, while they beat up Kingston and Harpo now covers Moxley and there's old pie face buck, old Matt Jackson, his spray tan was doing a Giuliani at this point. Which Excalibur tried to cover up by saying he thought he saw a tear. Yeah, no, he, <laughs> he, what he saw was his, either his fake spray tan or his fucking hair coloring dripping down his fucking smarmy face. What a fucking mess. No wonder anybody cares about any of this. So now the referee counted, and the referee counted three when Harpo covered Moxley after they've just seen, he's just seen all this shit go on right in front of him. But wait, there's an afterbirth. There's an afterbirth. Gallows and Anderson hold Moxley so the Cucamonga kids can super kick him again. Because they, if, they might have actually gotten their super kick over it. It just did the damage, but now they're going to do it again to get everybody used to it. it. What baby faces are now left in this company? 
There are 10 people in this fucking group alone now. You don't want to be on anybody's side because everybody's an asshole that turns on everybody else with, depending on which way the wind is blowing. Nobody has any honor or integrity. Paige's never been a heel. He's just been a sad, depressed drunk. This whole fucking company is sad and depressed. I'm sad and depressed after I have to watch this. Is that who they're appealing to, appealing to? I understand now that everybody in the modern generation is sad and depressed also. And and now it's it's a whole goddamn cottage industry of people being sad and depressed and worried. Imagine that. They've invented worry and anxiety over the past few years. We never had anything to worry about. We never had any anxiety. We weren't sad and depressed. We were just fucking miserable. It's life. Get over it. Nip up, sunshine. Tomorrow will be a brighter day. Fuck, I hate all these people. What do you think? I mean, this Young Bucks conflicted heel turn has been awful. I'm not as negative about Omega as you have always said. However, if you were going to make him your world champion and run with him, anything would have been better than the impact relationship and having the good brothers with him. Will you stop ripping paper? I'm not done. Are you ripping them into little strips? What are you doing? No, this is individual pages. Straight in half. Come on. How many pages do you have? Next to last. Do you hear this, Tony Khan? This is what you should be doing with your booking fucking sheets. Yeah. With your formats. Rip them up. Throw them away. This was bad. Again, the AEW hardcore fan is even getting sick of the way the Young Bucks have been presented for the last half of a year with the good brothers who really aren't doing anything to add to AEW and to the casual wrestling fan who doesn't care about new Japan stuff from five years ago, or just the guys from raw that you were tuning out. This whole thing is not good. This is really, really not good. And it's going to keep going this way. There's a trajectory right now. And there's a certain way the booking and the formatting of this show are going. And it's one direction. Not good. That's my final thoughts about this match, this angle, and this show. The conflicted Matt Jackson. I would love him to go to acting school. Take time off. Go to acting school. Maybe Cody and Brandy could recommend something if if you'll talk to them. But not good. Really not good. You're famous for saying not good. Rip Rogers is famous for saying fucking rotten. Fucking rotten. I think I'm going to go with Fucking rotten over not good. Anyway, speaking of fucking rotten, we're going to be back on. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to be back on Tuesday with the drive through where we talk about more fucking rotten. This is what it's come to, folks. You know, you like the program. You listen to the program that we do here because we we do have fun, Brian and I. But this is our only our only sanctuary anymore, all the people out there who used to really like to watch wrestling and now are either just don't have anything to watch except to have the piss taken out of it like we do, or are, as many of our fans are, actively enraged at what they've done to our favorite thing, and therefore you like to tune in so that we can take the piss out of it because we are the, not like Heyman, who's the voice of the homeless, we're the voice of the voiceless. And more people agree with us that are watching this shit because if you take the number of people who have quit watching wrestling in the past 20 years and you compare it to the number of people who still watch wrestling, then apparently it was about five times as many people that wanted to see the old stuff as do this fucking horse shit. So we're only going by the, the, the verifiable numbers, folks. Anyway. We're going to come back on Tuesday with WrestleMania, right? That's right. Something to make us appreciate AEW, WrestleMania. No, no, no. I was going to say there at least there's no AEW involved. I'm, I'll am i even watch 
Sasha Belair and Bianca Banks. You almost got that right. I'll watch all of them, both of them. However many matches they have. I don't want to see any more <laughs> AEW for a few days. All right. Anyway, we've gone on too long. And we will rectify that. We're going to wrap this one up. We'll see you back on Tuesday on the drive through Join us on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel if you just can't get enough. And until then, for Brian and all the other people who just don't give a shit anymore, thank you, fuck you, bye-bye, everybody.